Hello, and welcome to Did You Know Gaming Extra. In this episode, we'll start off by taking a look at Final Fantasy VIII, a game that was massive for its time, spanning four discs and over one and a half gigabytes of data. The expansive size of this adventure meant that the game's text and dialogue were similarly extensive, and would be a large undertaking to translate into other languages. When it came to translating the game into English, according to former Square localizer Alexander O. Smith, the US localization team had to use a GameShark cheat device to view the game's text for easier translation. This was because Square's Japanese headquarters didn't think to send the translators a copy of the game's text files along with the game. Smith told Polygon, You know, they were using GameSharks to hack Final Fantasy VIII so they could get to text because nobody would give them files. Because, oh, you need files to do translation? That was news to the dev team at that point. So that sort of complete lack of communication was emblematic of those days. But Final Fantasy VIII wasn't the only game by Square to have translation issues. Final Fantasy VII is the subject of debate when it comes to poor translations, as many believe the game's Spanish translation to be amongst the worst localization efforts in gaming. It was even dubbed the Spanish Zero Wing by some, referring to the infamously bad Zero Wing translation which gave us the All Your Base Are Belong To Us line. This translation of Final Fantasy VII sometimes calls the player's party of characters a fiesta, which means a literal celebration. The translation even refers to female characters like Aerith, Yuffie, and Tifa as if they were men. We could list many more of its faults, but we'd rather preserve our sanity and talk about another great turn-based RPG on the original PlayStation, which had a much better localization, Luna 2 Eternal Blue. The team working on the game's localization decided to include an easter egg in place of an oversight that was present in the original Japanese release. In the Japanese game, positioning Hero and Gwyn in a certain spot against the Guardian will result in an endless gameplay loop. This is because, when killed, Hero and Gwyn's bodies prevent the Guardian from moving to reach Lucia, and Lucia cannot attack in this battle, and so cannot kill the Guardian. But if the same situation is replicated in the English version of the game, the small, cute, non-playable character, Ruby, will kill the boss with a single hit to stop the loop. For today's random piece of trivia, we're going to talk a little bit about Ninja Bread Man. While the game is often recognized because of its infamy as an all-around terrible game, it was once planned to be recognized by another means entirely. The game was initially in development as a reimagining of the Zool series. Zool was considered to be a sort of mascot for the Amiga brand of computers in the early 90s, similar to how Crash Bandicoot was closely associated with the original PlayStation. Data Design Interactive, the company who created Ninja Bread Man, were given the rights to create an original title using the Zool license. But, as a result of Zool's shareholders being unimpressed with the work that had been made on the franchise's revival, they revoked all of Data Design's rights to the property. Instead of losing the work that they had put into the project, Data Design reworked the project into an original brand of Ninja Bread Man. In this episode, we'll be starting out with some trivia from the hit animated sci-fi comedy Rick and Morty. With the release of both Pocket Mortys in 2016 and Virtual Rickality in 2017, the franchise has firmly established itself as more than just a cartoon, expanding into a full-blown multimedia property. The games are a great bit of fun on the side, but could there be more to them? Surprisingly, according to the show's co-creator Justin Roiland, all the Rick and Morty games are actually canonical to the show. Their existence within the show's continuity is possible because Rick and Morty doesn't take place in just a single universe, but across an entire multiverse. Rick and Morty uses the Many Worlds interpretation of the multiverse hypothesis, which basically means the series can utilize an infinite number of universes. And because there's an infinite amount of Ricks and Mortys, the franchise must cover any conceivable scenario. As a result of this, Roiland believes every possible story would already exist in the Rick and Morty multiverse, and are therefore canon. Speaking of animated sci-fi comedies that got their own video games, there was an interesting event in the Futurama franchise, where cutscenes from its 2003 video game were repackaged and sold on a DVD. The cutscenes were meshed into a 30-minute video dubbed The Lost Adventure, and slightly edited to remove fourth wall-breaking moments and minor characters, as well as changing some sound effects. The episode was included as a bonus feature of the DVD for the Futurama movie, The Beast with a Billion Backs. Interestingly, this wasn't a spur-of-the-moment inclusion. According to Futurama co-creator David X. Cohen, 
the team were trying to get the lost adventure out for years. Several members of the show's crew worked on the cutscenes, and the team was so proud of it they considered it the honorary 73rd episode of the cartoon. Another beloved sci-fi series is Nintendo's Metroid franchise. Although the series has many on-the-nose references to things like the Alien movies, there's a few obscure nods to other products. The planet SR388 was the home of the Metroid race, and was the setting for Metroid 2 Return of Samus. Its name may seem like a bunch of random characters, but these letters and numbers do have meaning to them. According to Samus's character designer Hiroji Kiyotake, SR388 gets its name from the popular Yamaha SR400 series motorcycle engine. Although the engines were branded SR400cc, they actually have a slightly smaller capacity of 388cc, and so the team incorporated its true specs into the name. For this episode's random piece of trivia, we've decided to talk about an obscure Sega game, the often overlooked Sega Saturn title, Astal. The game was a 2D action platformer by Sega. It sold poorly in North America, which might have had something to do with the game's name not appearing on the spine of the box art. Though the sales may be due to its very short length, which led to the game being poorly reviewed by some critics. Although the game's obscurity is interesting, the most fascinating part of the game can't be seen by playing it. Within the game's data is an unused sprite of Mario. This is particularly interesting as Sega and Nintendo were rivals at the time of Astal's development. Nintendo probably wouldn't have allowed the Italian plumber to be featured in the game, so it may have been left in by Astal's developers just for fun. It's also worth noting that the style of the sprite doesn't match the game, which backs up the idea this was added by developers for their own amusement. Love them or hate them, internet memes are a part of our culture and often find their way into the media we consume. The video game giant Nintendo is one organization that often includes memes and pop culture references in their games. Not only do they reference memes during the localization process, but also seemingly at their headquarters in Japan. In one instance, Nintendo may have shown their appreciation for memes directly inside one of their consoles. In the Nintendo Switch's photo album setup page, an illustration strongly resembles the character Go from the Japanese porn film called A Midsummer Night's Lewd Dream. The film's character became part of a popular meme in Japan due to the production's over-the-top acting. Including this meme was harmless, and wasn't even noticed by most gamers. However, one of Nintendo's references to a meme left some fans rather upset. A number of Zelda fans were displeased after seeing translation differences between the releases of Triforce Heroes in the US and Europe. A diary in the game was a major factor in this anger, with the European translation reading, and that may be precisely why the ancient ruins I had encountered had been left undisturbed for me to explore. Whereas the American translation reads, Still, coming here at least afforded me the rare chance to explore these ancient ruins. So ancient. Such ruin. For those who are unaware of the meme being referenced, the end of the US translation makes reference to the popular Doge meme. Fans felt the American translation's inclusion of the meme was gratuitous and in bad taste, as the meme was never a part of the original text and arguably added nothing to the game. Controversy and Nintendo often go hand in hand, as can be seen with the 2009 case of Nintendo vs James Burt. James, a 24-year-old Australian, had uploaded a copy of New Super Mario Bros Wii to a file-sharing network prior to the game's official release in Australia. After Nintendo caught wind of the situation, they pushed to receive compensation for the gamer's direct copyright infringement. In a news article on the official Nintendo Australia website, the company claimed to employ the use of sophisticated technological forensics to identify the individual responsible. The result of the lawsuit was compensation of 1.5 million Australian dollars to be paid to Nintendo by Mr. Burt. In a statement, Burt advised others not to repeat his actions, and that he'll be paying this debt for the rest of his life. The story doesn't end there, however, as three years after the case, Burt received a surprise phone call from his local EB game store informing him that he had been selected by Nintendo to pick up a package from the store. Inside, he found a statue of Ganondorf, which was given away to pre-orders of the UK release of The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker HD. Nintendo gave no official reason to sending Burt the statue. James commented on Reddit saying, 
I think it's ironic that out of everyone in Australia they could have chosen, I get given the Ganon statue for being a good customer of Nintendo. I was told I was chosen from Nintendo and received it today. I'm very grateful they chose me, don't get me wrong, and I do love Nintendo even after being sued. And EB Games had no info on it, just that I won. No papers came with it, just the figure in a Nintendo brown box. And for this episode's random piece of trivia, we'll be talking a little bit about the Amiga and the United States. 19 public schools in the Grand Rapids School Public School District in Michigan used the Commodore Amiga to control their heating and air conditioning for more than 30 years. The system features a 1200-bit modem and wireless radio signal to toggle boilers, fans and pumps across the district. Efforts were made in 2015 to replace the systems, as they are of course becoming very dated and could stop functioning at any time. Responding to what they would do if the system just stopped working, Tom Hopkins, the GRPS maintenance supervisor, said they would look on eBay to buy a new one, which is where the current one came from. Many of us find it easy to separate the virtual world of video games from real life, particularly when they're cartoony or abstract, like Minecraft. However, games can teach us things about the real world, and can affect how and what we learn. Because of this, Minecraft's developers felt they had to remove a feature where players tamed parrots by giving them chocolate chip cookies. In real life, chocolate chip cookies can kill birds if they ingest them. This is because the compound theobromine is present in chocolate, which happens to be toxic to birds and other pets. The concerning fact was brought to light by Reddit user 1JL, whose post in the Minecraft subreddit quickly received nearly 40,000 upvotes. It was generally agreed that children who played Minecraft were impressionable and may unintentionally kill their pet birds by imitating the game. Lead creative designer on Minecraft, Jens Bergensten, told Vice, if Minecraft has any effect on children's behavior, we want it to be a positive one. Our reasoning for originally using cookies was twofold. It gave cookies a reason to exist within Minecraft, and it was a subtle reference to the Nirvana song, Polly. In the 1.12 build of Minecraft, the game was updated so that using cookies on parrots would kill them instead, and to tame them, seeds must be fed to the birds in place of cookies. Sticking with cookies, let's talk about the origins of Yoshi's Cookie. This Super Nintendo puzzle game wasn't always a part of the Mario series. While details are hazy, we can determine that the game's name was originally Hermetica. The game was first shown in 1992 at the Consumer Electronics Show. Nintendo bought the license for both the NES and Game Boy versions of Hermetica, and created Yoshi's Cookie by simply injecting Mario characters. Bulletproof Software still held the rights to their original SNES game, however, so Nintendo provided the devs with a license to use Mario characters and the Yoshi's Cookie branding. Wanting to create a fresh puzzle game, the team employed the skills of Tetris creator Alexei Pashitnov to design their levels. Evidence of this origin can be found hidden within Yoshi's Cookie on the Game Boy. A debug mode can be accessed in the game with a Game Genie. The title for this screen reads Hermetica Debug Mode in reference to the game's early development. Continuing with the theme of cookies takes us somewhere unexpected, the gory 1997 PC shooter Shadow Warrior. In the game's fourth level, Dark Woods of the Serpent, there's a destructible wall which can be blown up to reveal a small room. In the room is Tomb Raider's Lara Croft, chained up in a cell. When you approach her, Lo Wang will comment, <laughs> She's raided her last tomb. Inside her cell, the player can find one of the game's many collectible fortune cookies. Interestingly, Lara originally had a different appearance for this Easter egg, one which was far more risque. And now for today's random piece of trivia, let's talk about Karen, a character that debuted in Street Fighter Alpha 3 in 1998. That is, it would be her debut to most players. Her true game debut came in 1997 in Marvel Super Heroes vs. Street Fighter, where she could be found hidden away in the game's code. While being unfinished, several prototype sprites can be found in the game's graphics, though her appearance does differ from Street Fighter Alpha 3. In this initial design, she is little more than a minor edit of Sakura, giving her combat boots and a different head. Developers and publishers can show creativity outside of just the contents of their games. One example of this can be seen with a clever jab at those who purchased The Bard's Tale on PlayStation 2, Xbox or PC. On the game's disc is the line, for a really disturbing image, flip disc over. 
This was of course intended as a joke, as flipping the disc over would reveal nothing but the reflective surface of the disc, and like a mirror, show the reflection of whoever's in front of it. This wasn't the only gimmick to be featured on a game disc. Some publishers even used their game discs to help immerse the player in other ways, as can be seen, or rather smelt, with FIFA 2001. The game's PlayStation 1 disc featured a special scratch and sniff feature physically on the disc itself. When scratched, the coating released the odour of football pitch turf, but seemingly only in the PAL region. Another game that experimented with scratch and sniff tech was Gran Turismo 2, but again, only in the PAL region. In Europe, the game came on two discs. One red arcade mode disc and a GT mode disc that was blue. Gently rubbing the blue disc with your hand or a cloth would release the scent of rubber and fuel to replicate a pit stop smell. Even Nintendo had experimented with Scratch and Sniff in the manual for Earthbound on the Super Nintendo, but another developer planned to use the tech before Gran Turismo, FIFA, or even Earthbound were in development. At one point, Hideo Kojima actually wanted to coat the floppy disks of his 1988 adventure game Snatcher in a chemical that, when heated in the computer, would give off the smell of blood. This was to give the stench of a murder scene and make the game more immersive. Another game that came with some interesting disc shenanigans is Castlevania Symphony of the Night on the original PlayStation. The team at Konami wanted to give players a little bonus with the data on their disc, and made it so that putting the disc into a CD player or booting it through the PlayStation CD player menu would play a message. When played, the game's protagonist, Alucard, can be heard saying, As you can see, this is a PlayStation Black Disc. Cut number one contains computer data, so please don't play it. But you probably won't listen to me anyway, will you? The track then proceeded with the music that's been playing throughout this video. This next bit of trivia isn't quite about what's on a game's disc, but rather what's on a game's box art. Phoenix Games, who made the terrible PlayStation 2 game Peter Pan, are known for their shovelware, but in more recent times they've also been exposed for their repeated acts of plagiarism. If you look closely at the background of Peter Pan's box art, you might realise that the island is actually taken straight from the official artwork of Kingdom Hearts Destiny Islands. And for today's random piece of trivia, we're going way back to the 1989 NES game, Dragon Spirit The New Legend. During the final moments of the game's good ending, Princess Iris can be seen riding upon the dragon's head. In the Japanese version of the game, pressing select 20 times will cause Iris' skirt to lift up and give everyone a little look. This little secret was removed from the game's international releases, but the sprite of Iris' skirt lifting up still remains in the game's data. To the surprise of nobody, the HBO series Game of Thrones received several video game adaptations after its debut. These titles range anywhere from home console games to Facebook games, and have been played by an unsurprisingly large amount of people. One example of this can be seen with the Facebook game Game of Thrones Ascent. The game's servers crashed entirely when it first launched, due to hundreds of thousands of people trying to log in. One person who hasn't played a single one of them, however, is the author of the original Song of Ice and Fire books, and co-executive producer of the show, George R.R. R. Martin. Martin seems to have no distaste for the Game of Thrones games, or even gaming in general. In fact, he quit video games in the early 80s due to some degree of addiction. Martin told the LA Times, It wasn't that I didn't like them, it was that I liked them too much, and I think I probably lost, uh, you know, a novel or two there. Uh... Another interesting connection between gaming and Game of Thrones is that the show's co-creator, Daniel Brett Weiss, wrote for the cancelled Halo movie in 2006. And speaking of Halo, and games based on or inspired by books, the concept of the ring-shaped megastructures in the Halo franchise was inspired by the Ringworld series of books by Larry Niven. The Halo structures are remarkably similar to the megastructure in the Ringworld series, as anyone who has read the books will tell you. However, the Ringworld is enclosed around a large star, whereas the Halos orbit smaller bodies, and are themselves much smaller. What's interesting about this is that publishers of the Halo novels, Del Rey Books, actually contacted Niven about writing a Halo novel. 
Niven turned down Del Rey's offer, as he only writes for a series if he's already familiar with the source material. Microsoft actually sent Niven an Xbox with a copy of Halo to persuade him, but to no avail. Sticking with the theme of books, let's talk about the game I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream, which is based on the short story of the same name. In the final part of the game, while playing as Ellen, she'll say, I'm an engineer, not a brain surgeon. This is thought to be a reference to Dr. McCoy from the original series of Star Trek, as he'd often say, I'm a doctor, not a, then state an occupation. One of the game's designers was Harlan Ellison, who also voiced the supercomputer Am, and wrote the book the game is based on. Ellison would also sell scripts to TV shows, and one of these shows was the original Star Trek. And for today's random piece of trivia, we'll be taking a look at a company we've already talked about on this channel, Phoenix Games. Last time we talked about Phoenix Games, we demonstrated that they had stolen artwork from Kingdom Hearts and used it for the cover of their Peter Pan game. It turns out this wasn't the only time that they had plagiarized artwork. The pre-release box art for their arcade shooter, Dead Eye Jim, reused art from the cover of Outlaw on the Commodore 64. Phoenix Games managed to change the art before Dead Eye Jim was published, probably to avoid being sued into oblivion. Mario Kart has always been a fun game for children and adults alike. Mario and his friends have some heated battles and races, and taunting each other is all part of the fun. However, one character seems to have taken taunting a little too far. In update 1.1 of Mario Kart 8 Deluxe on the Switch, a gesture for the Inkling Girl was altered. The original animation involved the girl bending her arm at the elbow, gripping her bicep with the other hand, and emphatically raising her fist. This could have been interpreted as a gesture known as bras d'honneur, or Iberian slap. While the gesture isn't offensive in Japan, across some of Europe and Latin America it's akin to flipping someone off. In the update, the gesture was changed so that the Inkling girl just raised her fists to her opponent in a movement that looks more like a cheer. From one Nintendo Kart racer to another, let's talk about Diddy Kong Racing. Within the game's data are two unused characters, but the only way of accessing these in-game is by using a cheat device. The first of these unused characters is the pterodactyl seen in the Hot Top Volcano stage. Using action replay codes, players can set up a race where every character is the pterodactyl. Regardless of whether the player or AI wins these races, the You Lose jingle will play. The game may believe that a pterodactyl crossing the finish line means that the player has lost. This suggests that the player is supposed to race against it as a main character, but because the game only detects the pterodactyl crossing the finish line, it's assuming the player has lost. The pterodactyl also has an unused getting hit sound effect, which adds to the idea of there being a planned pterodactyl boss. The second character is a snowball, which follows a similar set of rules in its AI to the boos featured in Mario games. If racing as this snowball, the player is unable to move. However, computer players can proceed through the stage as long as the player is facing away from them. This means that their movement is never seen as they remain completely static when in view. From one unused feature in a racing game to another, Penta Penguin of Crash Team Racing, who's unlockable by using in-game cheat codes, has unfinished programming in the game's North American release. Acquiring the Mask power-up will display an Uka Uka icon, but will summon Aku Aku instead. Since either mask is summoned based on the character's morality, this oversight has left some players wondering whether Penta Penguin is a hero or a villain. Also bizarre, some of Penta's voice effects are just sounds penguins make, but there are two samples that sound more like a human talking. These are actually placeholder sounds that were meant to be removed from the final game. The samples are of an unidentified man reading the file names. Penguin Ye 1, Penguin Ye 2. This was fixed in the European release. And for this episode's random piece of trivia, let's look at the Sims 3 Roaring Heights DLC. By looking at the bizarre letters on the side of the school building, we can see that this is simply a phrase which has been flipped upside down and reversed. By fixing the transformation, we can actually see that the school's name is... Um... W yeah, I'll just put it on screen. The Virtual Boy has a reputation for being, generally speaking, not good. It sold poorly and had very few games. 
Nintendo released barely any titles from their major franchises onto the system, and those that were released felt subpar. One series that had no love on the console was Metroid. However, Samus has a pretty cool appearance in the game Galactic Pinball. The Cosmic stage features a hidden bonus level. To access this stage, the player must hit their ball into the top right of the board, start the bumper clash sequence, and then break all of the bumpers. An S symbol from Super Metroid will then replace the bumpers, and the ball will transform into Samus's ship. An audio cue will say, Roger, Samus. And the Super Metroid theme will begin to play. The player must then shoot all of the on screen enemies, including Metroids. Speaking of pinball, an interesting and somewhat controversial statement once came from a pinball games developer. The developer in question is Stuart Gilray, director of Pinball Challenge Deluxe on the Game Boy Advance. Due to a hardware issue, Pinball Challenge Deluxe would fail to save any data once it was turned off, even though a save feature was coded into the game. After being contacted by a member of the now-defunct Pocket Heaven forums, Gilray stated, We created the game to allow saves, etc., but for some reason, I'm guessing budgetary, Ubisoft at the last minute decided to not manufacture the game with EEPROM save memory. He also went on to say that the game is capable of saving if played through the use of a flash cartridge which was commonly used for pirating games. This led to Gilray's controversial statement, which was, Oddly enough, I encourage people that play Pinball Challenge Deluxe to play it on a backup cart just so to allow saving. It seems that developers who have somewhat condoned piracy aren't that rare when it comes to pinball devs. Digital Illusions was a successful developer who made multiple pinball titles, including Pinball Dreams, Pinball Fantasies, and Pinball Illusions, and later became the EA studio DICE. One of Digital Illusions' co-founders, Andreas Axelsson, got into games partly because of piracy, which at the time made games more accessible. In an interview with Lemon Amiga, Axelsson said, 15 years ago, there was no internet to speak of, very few games magazines, and even fewer places you could buy games. I would probably never have become so interested in games if I hadn't had access to cracks. On the other hand, when Pinball Dreams was released, I formatted every single crack I had, and started buying everything. Today though, you can buy almost everything from anywhere, so I think the excuse of availability holds less today. For today's random trivia, we wanted to show a little something from the Klonoa series. For the remake of the original game on the Nintendo Wii, the team considered a special redesign for the title's North American release. The design featured Klonoa without his iconic hat, and a different set of ears. Several of the original game's developers came back for this project, and they apparently thought Klonoa's design was a bit old-fashioned and in need of a change. The concept was scrapped, however, due to negative reception from both critics and fans alike, some even comparing it to Poochie, a character in The Simpsons used to represent needless changes to television series. Today we'll be talking about how the stories of video games are changed before they release. The beginning of a character's creation is always interesting, but the details of how a character came to be are usually hazy. Rayman is a character whose origin has always been left ambiguous within the series lore. However, his creation in the real world reveals some interesting choices that were dropped during development. The original story of Rayman was considerably different from the game's final release, initially following the story of a young boy named Jimmy. An article published on an old Usenet board provides us with the game's original press release. Join Jimmy, a ten-year-old who escaped reality by entering Here It's Cool, a fantasy kingdom he created within the realms of his computer. When in Here It's Cool, Jimmy becomes Rayman, a superhero who gives animated life to everything around him. Mushroom, insects, trees, rocks, mountains, creating an unlimited amount of friends and kingdoms. But an evil power has entered Here It's Cool and is out to destroy everything he has created. He must use his superhero powers to save his friends before it's too late. Look for Rayman on the Jaguar during the fourth quarter. We hear it's cool. <laughs> That's comedy. This plotline was scrapped entirely by the time of the game's launch in 1995, almost a year after the game was initially slated to release. Games changing their plots is nothing new, of course, as can be seen with 1999's Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine. The game's plot was retooled so that George Lucas could use the concept of aliens in Kingdom of the Crystal Skull and have it be a first for the franchise. The game's designer, Hal Barwood, told Adventure Classic Gaming, 
Independently of George, I got interested in propelling India into the Cold War environment of the 1950s with Russians as antagonists and flying saucers as the prize. George vetoed the idea, reserving UFOs for what was to become Crystal Skull. I kept the Cold War but veered away to Babylon for the prize. This shouldn't come as a surprise, as Lucas has a track record of causing issues for the games he meddles with. For the 2008 third-person shooter Fracture, Lucas took issue with the protagonist's name. After working together and deciding on a suitable name, the development team revealed the hero's name to be Mason Briggs. However, according to an anonymous designer who spoke with Game Informer, in his first viewing of Fracture, Lucas said the game looked good, but that he didn't like the name Mason Briggs. Lucas said something to the effect of, It doesn't really fit. When he jumps on stuff, he moves pretty fast. I like BJ Dart. The team went back to the drawing board again, trying to find a name that might be more appealing to Lucas. They ultimately landed on Jet Brody, and you might be surprised to learn that Lucas's son is also named Jet. And now it's time for this episode's random piece of trivia. This time we're going to dip into the Olympics, the Video Olympics on the ZX Spectrum. The sponsorship banners in the background of each event feature a number of parodies of popular brands, including Adidas, and even one which reads Cocaina in a visually similar style to the Coca-Cola logo. The game was developed in Spain, and when translated from Spanish, the word says cocaine. This was likely added as a small joke by the team, and is possibly a reference to the fact that when Coca-Cola was first invented, it contained cocaine. Also of interest, it seems like the game's title screen music is just a simplified version of the Superman theme tune. And today, we'll be talking about comic book-based games. Superhero franchises seem to be all the rage these days, but to be fair, they've always been popular. This is especially true for Marvel's top dog, Spider-Man. As well as a successful comic series and a string of blockbuster films, there's plenty of Spider-Man games, and some of them are quite interesting. One interesting Spider-Man tidbit that stands out can be found in Spider-Man 2 Enter Electro for the original PlayStation. The game has a cheats menu where the player can input words to unlock things like extra costumes or even a big head mode, and if the player inputs an incorrect cheat, the incorrect entry will be erased. However, if the player inputs any kind of profanity, Spider-Man himself will jump on screen and change the word into something nice, like puppy or flower. This will even happen if the player tries to disguise the profanity within other words or letters. Another Spidey-related secret can be found in X2 Wolverine's Revenge in all versions besides the Game Boy Advance release. If the player manages to collect all of the game's dog tags, a deleted scene will unlock. In the scene, a shadowy figure stalks Wolverine, who Logan then attacks. The figure turns out to be Spider-Man, who's dropped by to offer Wolverine his help in battling Magneto. Keeping with the theme of comic book-related games, let's take a look at some unused content from the action RPG Marvel Ultimate Alliance. The game was developed by Raven Software, but ported to the PSP and Wii by Vicarious Visions, who are a subsidiary of Activision. To promote the Wii version of the game, someone at Activision or Vicarious Visions thought it would be a good idea to try and include Nintendo characters in the game. Both Link and Samus were put into the game, and they were demoed to Nintendo to get the company's approval and input. However, Nintendo did not approve Activision's request, and there are several ideas as to why. Firstly, the characters seem to have been demoed to Nintendo in the PlayStation 2 version of the game by a genius. This could have understandably rubbed Nintendo the wrong way, as presenting their characters on a competitor's hardware could be seen as insensitive. Some also believe it was because Activision demoed the characters to Nintendo before they had gotten approval, and it came across as presumptuous. Or it could simply be that Nintendo didn't think the game or demonstration was of a high standard and refused. According to artist Jason Harlow, Link's model was entirely finished in just a week, so this demo may have been hastily made and lacked polish. We've been stuck on Marvel for a while now, so let's stop off at a DC Comics franchise. Batman The Brave and the Bold was developed by WayForward for the Wii and Nintendo DS, and featured tracks from seasoned game composer Jake Kaufman. Two unused tracks can be found on the Wii game's disc titled Batman underscore song dot og and song underscore driving dot og. What's interesting about these tracks is that they're from the Cowboy Bebop anime soundtrack. According to Kaufman, these tracks were placeholders and were the only music in the game for about eight months of its production. 
And for today's random piece of trivia, let's take a look at Adventure Time. Hey Ice King, why do you steal our garbage for the Nintendo DS and 3DS? At Comic-Con 2012, Adventure Time's creator, Pendleton Ward, said that when the game is beat, it would play a video of him in a chair congratulating the player, in a similar fashion to Pepsi Man on the PlayStation. You got it! Yeah! Yeah! When the game released, however, the gag was absent. It's believed this scene was swapped out for the secret screen in the 3DS game, where upon entering the Konami code, a pixelated pen ward will dance next to Finn and Jake, singing ba -da 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 secret screen, secret screen. Today we'll be talking about gaming in the music industry. Cross-media promotion is nothing new. It explains why we have so many games based on movies and vice versa. The music industry made use of people's interest in gaming during the 90s, with popular bands being hired by publishers to promote their games. One of these bands was London pop group Right Said Fred, famous for their hit single, I'm Too Sexy For My Shirt. The group were hired by Sega of Europe in 1994 to promote the latest Sonic game, Sonic the Hedgehog 3. The band's single, Wonder Man, was reworked by Sega to help promote the game, and featured lines such as, So fast it hurts, you'll get a slap. If you take a nap, he'll spin attack. The song's music video also prominently featured the game, along with Stephen O'Donnell, an actor who was considered the face of Sega's European advertising at the time. The track reached number 55 in the UK singles chart, and was featured on the Hits compilation album Now That's What I Call Music 27. While admirable, the song has nothing on the success of the Italian Europop group Eiffel 65. Eiffel 65 are best known for their one-hit wonder, I'm Blue Dabu Di Dabu Die, and they wanted to reference their love of gaming. The band did this on their album, Europop, with the song, My Console. The song is essentially a love letter to the original PlayStation, and references Tekken 3, Metal Gear Solid, Resident Evil, Gran Turismo, Omega Boost, Bloody Roar, Ridge Racer, Oddworld, Winning Eleven, and the X-Files game. Other bands don't seem as fond of the PlayStation or video games in general. The Californian punk band Smut Peddlers seem to think the world would be better off without gaming. Their song PlayStation Generation takes a cynical jab at gaming and media consumption, and what they might be doing to young adults. Some of the song's lyrics are, It wouldn't be the endo if you smashed up your Nintendo. For once in your life, make a sound decision, kill your f***ing <coughs> television. PlayStation Generation. In direct contention with Smut Peddlers is the band Horse the Band, who have made an entire career out of embracing their video game systems through their music. Some of the band's songs directly reference specific games and characters, such as the track Pole's Voice, Big Blue Violence, and Birdo, which describes a typical encounter with the enemy in Super Mario 2. The band even pioneered a subgenre of rock music called Nintendo Core. And for today's random piece of trivia, we'll be taking a look at the PlayStation RPG series Ark the Lad. Ark the Lad was originally a Japanese exclusive series, but this changed in 2002. All three of the PlayStation games were brought to the West in the Ark the Lad collection by Working Designs, which also came with a making of bonus disc. If the player boots up the bonus disc and presses circle, square, circle seven more times, square, then start, a browser window will open. This window shows the contents of the disc currently loaded, and the player can even swap out the discs to look at the contents of other games. Pressing X will load whatever file is selected, and this can be done to all kinds of files such as cutscenes. Be careful though, as this can apparently corrupt the contents of a memory card if it's plugged into the console. Today we'll be focusing on video game contests. Skyrim was released back in November of 2011, and has amassed over 30 million sales over the years. However, despite its popularity, you might not know that the creators of Skyrim, Bethesda, opened a challenge for a willing fan to not only deliver a baby on the release date of Skyrim, but also to name the child Doverkeen. On November 11th of 2011, the winners Megan and Eric Kellermeyer named their newborn son Doverkeen Tom Kellermeyer. For this bizarre feat of fandom, the family received a Steam key for the entire Bethesda Softworks library, including all future releases. Prior to the birth, Megan explained why she entered the contest in a blog post, stating, It is an awesome name, and yes, it comes with a fantastic prize. Now, my husband didn't know of the contest to start with. We conceived long before hearing of it, but it's been a tough year, and I wanted to do something special for my son. The next competition we'll be looking at comes from Activision way back in 2006. 
To promote the release of Marvel Ultimate Alliance, Activision held a voice acting competition, giving two fans the chance to star in the game as the Incredible Hulk's brainy alter ego, Bruce Banner, and the super-powered telepath, Jean Grey. I can save Atlantis on my own. The grand prize also included an Xbox 360 with a copy of the game, a poster of the game signed by comic book legend and cameo maestro, the late Stan Lee, as well as a lunch with the game's producers and a paid trip to Los Angeles for the recording. A woman by the name of Sarah Waits became the voice of Jean Grey, however none other than Aaron Hansen, also known as Ego Raptor, was cast as Dr. Bruce Banner in the PSP, Wii and PS3 versions of the game. A high budget big name video game has my voice in it. Whoa, check out Marvel Ultimate Alliance for the PS3, Wii and PSP and take a listen to Dr. Bruce Banner's voice. Don't check out the Xbox 360, PS2, GameCube or Xbox versions though. They do not feature my voice and instead feature some other guy's voice as Bruce Banner. Don't be fooled, I'm only in the other versions due to recording complications and time restraints. I know, I know, but it just goes to show you, only the next gen can handle my voice. The next contest we're featuring never actually made it to fruition. Id Software originally included a contest in Wolfenstein 3D. In Episode 2, Floor 8, right at the end of a particularly challenging secret maze, a sprite can be found reading, Call Apogee, say Ardwolf. The contest was cancelled after numerous cheats and map editors were created. This allowed players to navigate the maze much more easily, thus making the contest trivial. In later versions of the game, a particular part of the maze was blocked off, or the sign had been replaced with a pile of bones. In some versions of the game, letters would also be shown on the score table screen. These letters were planned to be part of another competition where players would call in with their scores and use the letter code to verify it. But again, with cheap programs circulating, this competition was also scrapped. And for this episode's random piece of trivia, we'll be adventuring, however unsuccessfully, to the legendary sunken city of Atlantis. As with many point-and-click games that followed Monkey Island, 1992's Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis did not feature any dead ends. However, it did keep the looming possibility of death for the hero, which was a feature present in previous indie titles. Throughout the game, there are a number of ways for the player to kick the bucket, all of which are followed by a tailored death message. However, one message found within the game's files never actually appears in the final version. The message reads, Suddenly, Indy forgot everything he knew about handling a bullwhip and flogged himself to death. Today we're talking about various unreleased projects relating to the developer Rare. Diddy Kong Racing for the Nintendo 64 was a popular kart racer for its time, selling just under 5 million units. The game did so well, in fact, that a few developers thought about creating a sequel. British team Climax Studios pitched a potential sequel to Nintendo around April of 2004, and thanks to video game researcher P2P Online, a few of this game's details have been uncovered. The game was tentatively titled Diddy Kong Racing Adventure, and its story would have had WizPig propose a rematch against Diddy and his friends, with WizPig aiming to pave over a forest. The player would have travelled through 16 different villages, each containing three courses. Villages were styled after a different character within the Donkey Kong Country series, with each being under the control of a different bad guy. The aim was to defeat these enemies in a one-on-one -on -one race and free the villagers. The variety of vehicles would have included buggies, quad bikes, planes, hover bikes and jet skis. Progression would have allowed upgrades to these vehicles which would have unlocked access to more areas. New game modes were also considered, such as Demolition Derby mode and a sort of Simon Says game. While the concept aimed to include many of the original characters from the N64 release, it's likely that some would have been scrapped due to Rare's hold on licenses, such as Banjo-Kazooie and Conker's Bad Fur Day. The original game's developer, Rare, were bought by Microsoft in 2002 for $375 million. After a few attempts at traditional games, the team were put forward to create titles for Microsoft's Kinect peripheral. They came up with different ways to use the device, and a large number of prototypes were developed. According to a former member of the team, Nick Burton, we were doing tons of prototype, insane things like giving it to a programmer for 48 hours and telling him to do whatever he liked. One guy did a seagull simulator, being able to poo on passers-by. Another prototype the team had worked on was Savannah, a concept that was put together to provide a realistic look at raising a lion from birth to adulthood. According to ex-member Donica Murphy, the project was put forward by artist Phil Dunn, a veteran at the studio who'd worked on games such as Donkey Kong Country 3 and Killer Instinct 2. Savannah never came to fruition, but a video showing several models from the project did surface. 
Explaining the project's lack of green lighting within Microsoft, Murphy told Not Enough Shades, It was soon clear that Microsoft were more interested in using Rare to help aim at a younger market. Rare was renowned for their diverse portfolio, so to not be involved in making mature games was a real blow. There were numerous projects that were put forward that I believe would have been huge hits, but Microsoft rejected them one after the other. The team were all interested in creating a sequel to Killer Instinct at this time, but Microsoft weren't interested in creating another fighting game, with Murphy believing that no new Killer Instinct would ever be made. It seems that sadly he left the company prior to the development of Microsoft's free-to-play Killer Instinct release. And for this episode's random piece of trivia, we'll be taking a look at Sega's Arnold Palmer Tournament Golf. If the player hits a ball 100 times on the pitch without sinking it, they'll be taken to the Game Over screen. If the player enters the famous Konami code on this screen, the game will load up a hidden copy of the 1986 classic Sega arcade game, Fantasy Zone. Today we'll be talking about all things love and video games. Love and marriage. Some say they go together like a horse and carriage. But you know what they also say? Love is blind. Love Plus, a dating sim game released exclusively in Japan, lets the player choose one of three girls. The player can then take the girl of their choosing on dates and interact with them in an attempt to obtain their eternal affection. One of these girls, Nene Anagasaki, has now officially tied the knot. A Japanese gamer with the username Sal9000 married his dearly beloved in November of 2009. While their interactions are entirely digital, their wedding was anything but virtual. Their ceremony was held in Guam, and while we aren't professionals in marital law, it seems to us that Guam is one of the few places in the world where marrying both inanimate or even imaginary objects is perfectly legal. Media were invited to the reception, which was also broadcast online at the video-sharing website Nico Nico. The couple shared slides of their time shared together in the lead-up to their wedding, before Sal 9000 sealed the deal with a kiss. Oui. Sal 9000 even upgraded his dearest's hardware to the then newly released DSi XL. Sal 9000 wished to keep his real name private for fears of being misunderstood. He told Reuters, In the Japanese otaku or nerd culture, there's a tradition of calling characters my wife, and I sort of thought of Nene as my wife. Since I was calling her that, I thought we'd just have to get married then. If more people were to find ways of expressing themselves like this, I think it would make society a bit more interesting. When asked if he would stay with Nene for life, even if a new version of Love Plus was released, of which there have now since been two, Sal stated, I think I'll probably continue playing Love Plus. I won't cheat. Moving on with love that knows no bounds, let's talk about the Khajiit race in the very popular open-world RPG series, The Elder Scrolls. A book within the Elder Scrolls universe named The Real Berenzia contains a whole ten volumes when it first appears in Daggerfall. Unfortunately, the book was reduced to just five volumes when it was carried over to Morrowind, Oblivion, and Skyrim. In the full Daggerfall version, a Khajiit named Theris and Queen Berenzia engage in some physical romance. This was unfortunate for Queen Berenzia, as just like real cats, the Khajiit race have barbs on their penis. Another game that has more than enough love to throw around is Atari and Namco's Galaxian on the ColecoVision. That said, the game's display of love is hidden away in the game's code. The title has two notes left in its data. The first reads, Graphics and Program by James D. Eisenstein, August 11th, 1983, dedicated to the one I love. The second note reveals who this mysterious one is, stating, I love you, Janine. Isn't love just magical? Now it's time for this episode's random piece of trivia, and we'll be looking at the 2006 real-time strategy game, Company of Heroes. While it may only be a small dig at rival company EA, Relic Entertainment included an easter egg showing their true feelings for the company. In the game, the American side has access to jeeps to use as reconnaissance vehicles. Interestingly, these jeeps all feature the license plate 3A5UX5. When translated from typical internet leet speak, this can be read as EA Suxes. Today, we'll be looking at characters who cameoed in games before making their official debut. Building up to the release of Sonic the Hedgehog, Sega used all kinds of marketing tactics to create hype around the game. This included taking the game to trade shows and making bizarre advertisements. They even decided to put him in another game. 
Sonic's first video game appearance was in Radmobile, which hit arcades five months before Sonic the Hedgehog's release on the Sega Genesis in North America. Sonic took the form of an air freshener hanging from the top of the screen, with some surprisingly responsive physics at the time. Sega's idea to spotlight Sonic in another game clearly paid off, but our next character doesn't seem to be in a game for promotion. In fact, he's barely visible in it at all. While HAL Laboratory were developing Kirby's Dream Land for the Game Boy, they were also developing a role-playing game for the Super Nintendo called Arcana. Although the games have practically nothing in common besides being made by HAL, Kirby makes a sneak appearance in Arcana's opening sequence. Kirby can be seen among a band of evil warriors, and since the art is repeated, there's multiple Kirbys. Arcana released a month before Kirby's Dream Land in Japan, and three months before Dream Land in North America. For our next piece of trivia, we'll be taking a look at a much-loved company, Atlas, and their Persona franchise. The Persona series isn't shy about referencing other games and media, and this is especially true for Persona 3 Portable. In the game, there is an unnamed man drinking alone in Club Escapade. This man is none other than Vincent Brooks, the protagonist of Atlas's puzzle game, Catherine. Vincent gives hints about Catherine and tells the player to remember him, and that if they meet again, he'll tell the player more of his story. Persona 3 Portable came out about a year and a half before Catherine did in Japan, making this a fairly early cameo. In fact, Persona 3 Portable was released before Catherine was even publicly announced. Another character that featured in a game before their franchise debut was Galen Marek, also known as Starkiller. The Sith Apprentice had a playable appearance in Soul Calibur 4, a whole two months prior to the publication of Star Wars The Force Unleashed. Starkiller was unlocked by beating the arcade mode with Yoda in the Xbox 360 version, or Darth Vader in the PlayStation 3 version. And for this episode's random piece of trivia, let's take a look at the Game Boy Color game, Maya the Bee and Her Friends, by Acclaim. Since Maya the Bee isn't very well known outside of Europe, the game's graphics were changed, and it was brought to America as the new adventures of Mary-Kate and Ashley. Open, 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 Can we help you? But this isn't the first time the game was altered. The title was originally planned as a South Park game, and screenshots of it even exist. Not only this, but the graphics for Cartman, Kenny, Stan and Kyle can still be found in the game's data. Acclaim apparently wanted to base the game on the South Park license, but the show's creators, Matt Stone and Trey Parker, weren't comfortable with this idea. The duo reasoned that, since the Game Boy was marketed towards children, basing the game on the adult-oriented franchise would be irresponsible. Maya the Bee and her friends also contains an unused sprite of itch from The Simpsons. A claim were given The Simpsons license multiple times in the 90s, which led to several Game Boy titles being developed. This sprite may be the last remnant of an unreleased Simpsons game. Today we'll be looking at skating and video games. Skating games were quite common during the late 90s and early 2000s. However, gaming has a connection with professional skateboarder Tony Hawk before the skating craze even began. When Tony was low on cash, he would edit videos to help supplement his income, and some of his editing was for video game companies. He presumably used his skills to make advertising material for the Turbo Graphics, known as the PC Engine in Japan. Hawk stated, when, when things took a downturn in skating, like I was editing videos for Tom Yeto and actually for like a video game company. Like, <laughs> how ironic, actually. I never thought about that, that I was doing video, video editing for Turbo Graphics, and then I ended up getting a video game myself. Hawk would eventually get his own series of games with Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. The series would often promote characters and celebrities, with releases of Pro Skater games including many cameo appearances in the form of secret characters. For the South Korean release of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2, cameos were even given to a band featured in the Korean game. The Korean version of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 includes eight additional tracks performed by the popular K-pop group Thin KL. However, the game also allowed players to take control of all of the band's members and perform some gnarly tricks. The localization effort adds the additional characters to the game, while also keeping all in-game text in English. Another character with a celebrity connection to the Tony Hawk games came in the fourth Pro Skater title. Jenna Jameson, referred to by many as one of the most famous adult entertainers in the business, had a role within all versions of the game besides the PlayStation release. 
While not being named directly after her, the unlockable character Daisy is based on the actress in appearance as well as being voiced by Jameson herself. To unlock the character, the player must either complete the game with $100,000 and have found all gaps, or enter the not-so-subtle code shown on screen. This code was revealed by Neversoft in a promotional image that showed Daisy wearing a Santa hat and was shown to players around Christmas time. Neversoft may have included adult themes in the Tony Hawk games, but their engine for Pro Skater 4 was also utilized for something more child-friendly. Disney's Extreme Skate Adventure, created by Toys for Bob, used the Pro Skater engine to create a game which would promote skateboarding to a new generation. The game features an extreme skate crew, with characters all modeled after real children across America. Activision sought out 10 children for the game, all between the ages of 6 and 14. The publisher held live events at skate parks in several cities, which can be seen during the game's opening sequence. Kids were also able to enter the contest by mailing in photographs of themselves, along with tapes of their skills. Activision created a website which featured the 10 chosen kids so that the public could vote on who should be classed as superstars among the lineup. The two chosen were Ryan and Malianne, who would be featured on the skate stage alongside the various film characters also playable in the game. And for this episode's random piece of trivia, let's look at Ninja Gaiden 2 on the Xbox 360. In Chapter 4, A Captive Goddess, a room with some boards can be found. Destroying these boards will reveal a silver X, which can be examined to play the Xbox 360 boot sound. Examining the X will also restore the player's health. This object is actually based on the Direct Xbox, an unused design created during the development of the original Xbox. In this episode, we're going to be talking about figurines, toys, and video games. Nintendo launched their lineup of amiibo toys back in November of 2014, where they were met with a mixed but generally favorable response. Nintendo moving into the Toys to Life figurine market resulted in a huge volume of profit for the video game giant, with new amiibo continuously selling out. However, it seems that Rare had a similar idea to amiibo back in the days of the Nintendo 64. According to Chris Seaver, creator of Conker's Bad Fur Day, Rare founders Chris and Tim Stamper wanted to do amiibo-style things with toys during the Nintendo 64 era. Rare even made amiibo-like figures of two characters from a cancelled Xbox 360 fantasy game called Urchin. These renders were made about nine years before Amiibo were released, but since the game was cancelled in 2006, they'll remain concept art unless Rare ever revives the project. Another popular Toys to Life game is Skylanders, a series that has divided many fans of the Spyro series. But with Skylanders Supercharges, Activision was given permission to use the likeness of both Bowser and Donkey Kong. Other Nintendo characters were also considered for cameo appearances, but ultimately they were disagreed upon. Plans for a warrior Princess Peach were put forward, but Nintendo refused the idea as it seemed out of character for Peach. This led to all other Mario characters being off-limits as well. Activision even wanted to include Kirby, who would have been able to suck up enemies and bounce around the stage. But because the rights to the character are partially owned by HAL, the team were unable to gain a license to use him. The last Nintendo character considered was Fox McCloud, who was requested for the game as the Skylanders Supercharges world has a particularly heavy focus on vehicles. However, Nintendo felt that having Fox in the game might pull interest away from their own game, Star Fox Zero, which was to launch around the same time. Speaking of Star Fox Zero, Nintendo wanted to make an R-Wing amiibo for the game that could transform. According to series developer Shigeru Miyamoto, the amiibo would have been capable of transforming between its R-Wing state and its walker state, just like in the game. Miyamoto told Game Informer, we were working on a couple of ideas for the game for well over a year. We had an R-Wing amiibo that would transform into the walker, but it was really tough to execute that in the normal amiibo size and in a way that met with product safety standards. We had to give up on it. There's also been some speculation that we didn't get an R-Wing amiibo at all due to these safety standards, as the R-Wing would have been too pointy for children to play with in a safe manner. And now it's time for this episode's random piece of trivia, and we're talking Shining Force. The original Shining Force game contains a secret recruitable unit for the player's army, named Yogurt. Yogurt appears as a helmet-wearing hamster with some bizarre properties. 
Being viewed as a comic relief character in the game, most of his stats are just one point, and he can't actually level up. If the player somehow manages to defeat an enemy with him, they will be rewarded with the Yogurt Ring, an item which causes those who equip it to turn into yogurt during battle. However, this transformation will only affect the character's appearance, and they will retain all of their stats. Additionally, according to a Japanese Shining Force book, the character Yogurt and all of his kind are strange creatures which originate from the evil planet Yogurt. And today we'll be talking about hidden messages in games. Many video games have hidden messages somewhere in their code, and though most of them are just labels or notes for co-workers, some of them are more meaningful. One of these meaningful messages can be found within the data of the Game Boy game Bart Simpson's Escape from Camp Deadly. Using the game's debug options, it's possible to access some unused rooms at the end of the game's first level. These rooms have writing in their backgrounds, and when strung together, they form a message. The text reads, I love Maria. I promise to live with you and to be faithful to you for the rest of our lives. I promise to support and encourage you in the pursuit of your goals, and I promise to make a loving home with you. Mark and Maria saw the world, June 1990. This love letter was left by the game's programmer, Mark D. Klein. A much less heartwarming series of messages can be found in the Nintendo 64 puzzle game, The New Tetris. The game's lead programmer, David Priddy, left a series of rants in the data of The New Tetris. David assumed no one would ever find the rants, but they were discovered just a few days after its release. This seems to have gotten Pretty and the studio he worked at, H2O, in a bit of trouble with Nintendo. David's rants were mainly targeted at his co-workers, who David implied were incompetent. He accused the game's producer, Don McClure, of playing StarCraft and EverQuest when he should have been working, as well as lacking basic development knowledge and skills. David wrapped up his criticism of Don by saying, So Don, I must say this, hold on to and fake your job while you can, because once they find out how truly useless you are, you will be out of the job. David praised the game's musician, Neil Voss, but also went on to say he was lazy. David also left a list of his 56 most hated things, which included people with Kleenex, plants, knitted blankets, stuffed animals, or lacy things in their car's rear window. I should be allowed to pull over and shoot them. Other developers have also left heated messages in their games, and some of them were left specifically to be read by certain individuals. Examples of this can be seen in the various Amiga versions of Jurassic Park by Ocean Software. It appears that one developer left some messages for people who intended to crack and pirate the game. A message in the Amiga AGA version of the game reads, Crack this game and you die. I'm not kidding. I know who you all are. You have been warned. A message in the Amiga ECS version of Jurassic Park is even more unhinged, reading, Message to f <laughs> paraplegic and all the other <laughs> heads. Better luck this time. Try and remove more that 20% of the protection this time, you useless c <laughs> Isn't it time you stopped pulling your d <laughs> and left your bedrooms and got a real job? And for something less profane, let's move on to this episode's random piece of trivia. Today we're talking about the early 2000s vampire-centric hack and slasher, Blood Rain. At one point in the game, the player will come to an elevator that leads to several rooms. Inside one of the rooms is nothing but a shovel and a crate. Breaking open the crate will reveal what appears to be the Ark of the Covenant from the Indiana Jones film Raiders of the Lost Ark. In Raiders of the Lost Ark, Nazis try to acquire the Ark to help win World War II by supernatural means. This reference is appropriate as Blood Rain's villains, the GGG, are also seeking out supernatural means of bringing power to Germany. In this episode, we're going to be talking about obscure versions of games. Limited releases and special editions of games are nothing new, and thanks to the internet, recent special editions of games are fairly well documented. Due to a lack of freely available documentation, however, special editions of many retro titles have fallen into obscurity. In the 1980s, Nintendo released a series of multiplayer versus arcade machines with special versions of popular titles within their library of games. These included Versus Excite Bike, Versus Pinball, and Versus Tennis. Perhaps the rarest of these machines, however, was an obscure spin off of their Versus Stroke and Match Golf arcade game titled Versus Ladies Golf. It seems the only difference in Ladies Golf is that Nintendo swapped out the male golfer's sprite with that of a female one. Despite Nintendo's efforts, there seemed to be very little interest in the game. Versus Ladies Golf was reported very unsuccessful at the time, which contributed to its extreme rarity. 
This wouldn't be Nintendo's only rare arcade machine, with cabinets of Punch-Out and Super Punch-Out also proving to be quite elusive. The reason for this is due to the way the game functioned in arcades, featuring a double-screen setup. These cabinets follow the same specifications for Nintendo PlayChoice 10 machines, which would feature instructions on one screen and gameplay on the other. Nintendo sold a conversion kit to help arcade operators convert these old Punch-Out! series machines into PlayChoice 10 cabinets. Since these modified cabinets could store up to 10 games, they would likely draw more players. This led to many Punch-Out! cabinets being converted to increase profits, and also resulted in Punch-Out! and Super Punch-Out! machines being significantly harder to find. Nintendo was quite open to the idea of special editions back in the 80s and early 90s. In 1986, they even helped release a special edition of Super Mario Bros., which was exclusively given out to contest winners of the Japanese radio show All Night Nippon. Instead of being published by Nintendo, it seems to have been published by Fuji Television, who owned the station that broadcast the show. The game was essentially a remixed version of the original Super Mario Bros., but it also included some elements from the Japanese Super Mario Bros. 2, which is known as the Lost Levels in the West. Some of the game's visuals were modified to resemble celebrities from the All Night Nippon Show and the Nippon Broadcasting System radio station. And for this episode's random trivia, let's talk about Guitar Hero 3. The game included the chart-topping hit Welcome to the Jungle by Guns N' Roses, which was added to the game after frontman Axl Rose made a deal with Activision. The deal included a promise from Activision that the game would feature no reference to ex-Guns N' Roses guitarist Slash. Activision not only featured Slash prominently in the game and its promotional material, but also included Slash's post-Guns N' Roses band, Velvet Revolver. After Axl Rose learned of this breach in agreement, he attempted to sue Activision for $20 million, but did so too late. Rose's filing was made in November of 2010, over three years after the game's 2007 release. This resulted in his claims being dismissed in court. Commenting on the late filing in his deposition, Rose stated, The reason I did not file a lawsuit is because Activision offered me a separate video game and other business proposals worth millions of dollars to resolve and settle my claims relating to Guitar Hero 3. From December 2007 through November 2010, Activision was offering me a Guns N' Roses dedicated video game. If an oral contract is broken, it's only possible to file for a lawsuit within two years of the incident that broke the agreement. And since it had been three years since his agreement with Activision, Rose had no grounds to sue. Today we'll be looking at unique advertising methods in the game industry. Brand promotion within games is nothing new. Advertisements for real-world products spring up all the time in virtual worlds, with some games even being based on these brands entirely. Parappa the Rapper 2 took part in one of these deals, but not for the game's final release. Demo discs with preview builds of both Parappa the Rapper 2 and the Japanese exclusive Ape Escape 2001 were once sold by McDonald's in Japan. This was to cross-promote both McDonald's and the games, which came on discs titled The McDonald's Happy Disc. In this demo version of Parappa the Rapper 2, the game's first level, in which Parappa prepares burgers in a generic fast food joint, instead takes place inside a McDonald's. Master Beard can also be seen wearing a McDonald's branded apron, and McDonald's iconography can be seen within the game's UI. With the demo of Ape Escape, loading screens show the apes eating McDonald's burgers, and within the game itself, McDonald's advertising can be seen plastered around on buildings and blimps. There's also the occasional giant floating burger and fries. The disc also came with a promotional video of an ape and a man wearing a rainbow afro running around New York City. Taking a pretty big leap in style, let's take a look at the real-time strategy series Command & Conquer. To promote the game, Virgin Interactive, the game's publisher, put an ad into British magazines featuring the mugshot of several historical politicians and military leaders, including both Hitler and Stalin. Also on the poster is Jacques Chirac, the then-current French president who had been in a lot of hot water for his decisions to test nuclear weapons in the South Pacific. The ad rubbed several news organizations the wrong way. The Independent's Tom Wilkie wrote an open letter to the company to voice his issues, as well as seeming to point the blame to nerd culture at that time. What sort of nerds are you employing? I can imagine them saying to themselves, gosh, that's really witty, using mass murderers to promote a consumer product. 
It's not witty, it's crass, ignorant, and stupid. It's also, I would have thought, actionable. They also state that the company promoted Doom 2 by sending journalists sheep's entrails, and that the only lesson they learned from this stunt was that crass, nerdish ignorance sells. If the writer's feelings weren't already obvious, he goes on to insult Virgin Interactive, stating, We are being deracinated by you and your kind. Your nerds probably will need to consult their CD-ROM dictionary for that one. I hope Mr. Chirac sues for every penny you have. Moving on to something a bit more recent, EA's popular racing game Burnout Paradise also features politicians, but this was because politicians actually bought advertising space within the title. In the game, billboards could be seen across Paradise City, which EA could control and change. In 2008, the campaign for then-presidential candidate Barack Obama paid for their ads to appear on Burnout billboards within 10 states. The sign, with the tag, paid for by Obama for president, reminded players that early voting had begun. And for today's random piece of trivia, we'll be taking a look at the acclaimed survival horror sequel, Resident Evil 2. At the police station in Scenario A, the player meets Marvin Branner as he rests against a locker. A tag on the locker reads, Jojo. This was confirmed by Hideki Kamiya to be a reference to the manga and anime series Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. It could even be a nod to Capcom's Jojo's Bizarre Adventure fighting game, which came out in the same year as Resident Evil 2. The reference also appears in the 2019 Resident Evil 2 remake. Today, we'll be talking about voice acting secrets in video games. We all know everyone's favorite grizzled, gravelly voiced espionage expert, Snake, from the Metal Gear series. And it's no secret that Snake is based on Snake Plissken from the dystopian sci-fi action flick, Escape from New York. But what if we told you that the face of this character, Kurt Russell, could have been the voice actor for Naked Snake in Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater? David Hayter had been the voice of Solid Snake and Big Boss for more than a decade, before losing the role to Kiefer Sutherland for Metal Gear Solid 5, much to the dismay of some fans. However, it seems as though Kojima had been trying to recast their starring role for some time. David Hayter said, I had to re-audition for Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater to play Naked Snake. They made me re-audition to play Old Snake in Metal Gear Solid 4, and the whole time they were trying to find someone else to do it. I heard that Kojima asked one of the producers on Metal Gear Solid 3 to ask Kurt Russell if he would take over for that game. He didn't want to do it. And continuing the discussion of voice actors in high-profile games, let's take a look at the Resident Evil series. Richard Wark, the second voice actor for Albert Wesker, was inspired by the main antagonist of the Walt Disney adaptation of The Jungle Book. This, of course, is the vicious yet suave man-eating tiger, Shere Khan. It was in fact the intimidating, albeit soothing voice of the tiger that influenced Richard. Richard said he liked the idea of the military-type character having a cultured, chocolatey voice like George Sanders. Moving on from one Disney property to another, Oscar Isaac, best known for his role as Poe Dameron in the Star Wars franchise, also lent his voice to the Force Awakens section of Disney's Infinity. However, this wasn't his first attempt at voice acting within a game. Though it's not clear what role he was meant to play in the title, Isaac revealed that he was fired from his voice role in EA's Dante's Inferno. In a conversation with Devin Faraci from Birth Movies Death, I had done a video game before, but I got fired off it. I think they just thought I was bad. It was such a shitty game though, Dante's Inferno. Terrible. I had no choice. It was a forced dodge. And now it's time for this episode's random piece of trivia, and we're talking about Sega. As part of their advertising campaign for the launch of the Dreamcast in Europe, Sega struck an official sponsorship deal with the Arsenal Football Club in the Premier League. The team wore Dreamcast shirts when they played in their home stadium in London, and wore Sega shirts when they played away in other stadiums. This was an attempt to raise awareness of the Dreamcast, but it seems that Sega should have done a little more research before taking the plunge. The Arsenal team were frequently mocked when playing against Italian teams. This is because the word Sega can be perceived as a vulgar word in Italian, especially when put into a certain context. The phrase Farsi una Sega can mean to wank or jerk off. To get an idea of how it was for Italian spectators to see Sega everywhere, Imagine having the slang word for masturbate printed across a team's shirt. Hello, and welcome to Did You Know Gaming Extra. Today we'll be talking about Hollywood actors who appeared in video game commercials before they were famous. 
In today's world, famous actors and video games go hand in hand. Stars such as Samuel L. Jackson and Sir Patrick Stewart appear in huge titles like Castlevania or Grand Theft Auto. But a few big stars got involved with video games long before they were the A-listers that we know today. Even one of our favorite actors and musicians, Jack Black, was unable to escape gaming's reach. Before his start in music and acting, Black appeared in a commercial for Activision. This advertisement was to promote their latest game on the Atari 2600, 1982's Pitfall. In the ad, Black describes his experiences with the game. Just last night, I was lost in the jungle with Pitfall Harry, surrounded by giant scorpions and man-eating crocodiles. This was several years before Black got a gig in a TV show, and a decade before he received regular work. Another popular actor, Paul Rudd, is best known for his work on films such as Anchorman and Ant-Man. Here, Rudd lends his acting prowess to Nintendo, demonstrating the amount of fun that can be had by playing the Super Nintendo. The commercial shows newly released and upcoming SNES games, and was aired in 1991, about a year before Rudd's first credited appearance on TV. Yet another A-lister featured in a gaming commercial is Tobey Maguire of Spider-Man fame. Maguire acted in an early 90s commercial for the Atari's Game Boy rival, The Lynx. Although this was one of Maguire's earliest acting moments, his first was a few years before, but was also gaming related. The first time Maguire was on a movie set was for 1989's The Wizard, which featured heavy product placement of Nintendo games and hardware. I love the power glove. It's so bad. Maguire appears in the film uncredited, standing by the film's antagonist, Lucas. Interestingly, Maguire didn't even intend to be in the film. Maguire told Collider.com, I was friends with a kid in that movie, and I was visiting the set, and I basically just had an opportunity to be an extra. That might have been my first gig in any kind of professional production. Nintendo seems to be pretty good at picking out future stars for their commercials. Another advertisement promoting the use of a link cable for Pokemon on the Game Boy starred none other than the titular Drake and Josh actor, Drake Bell. Although this was made before Bell was famous in his own right, he had appeared on TV with a minor role in an episode of Seinfeld. And for today's random piece of trivia, we'll be talking about the Nintendo 64 action title, Blast Core. At the game's level select menu, the time it takes for the planets to revolve around the sun is exactly in proportion with real life, only sped up. It takes the Earth one minute to orbit the sun, which represents a full year. And within this same time frame, the moon revolves exactly 13 times around the Earth, just like its lunar orbit. With Mercury, it takes approximately 14 seconds to revolve around the sun, which is equal to 88 days. Venus takes 37 seconds to go around the sun, which is equal to 225 days. Mars takes 1 minute and 53 seconds, which equals to 687 days. Neptune takes 2 hours and 45 minutes, which equals to 165 years. Apparent retrograde motion also occurs when viewing the planets from a certain vantage point, which is when planets appear to travel across unusual paths in the sky. And today, we'll be looking at some early bloomers in the video game industry. The Pink Ball of Puff, Kirby, is one of Nintendo's most beloved characters. His 1992 debut title, Kirby's Dreamland, solidified his place in gaming by selling millions of units and spawning a series which continues to this day. Kirby's Dreamland was directed by Masahiro Sakurai, who also created the Kirby character. Sakurai's life led him to join a specialist school from an early age, in order to become an electrical engineer. He would later leave this school to join a regular high school, as he realized his true passion was in video games. Sakurai also found a part-time job in order to buy new games. After graduation, he secured himself a job at HAL Laboratories when he was only 19 years old and started his work on Kirby. His desire was to design not just a simple character, but also a simple game, with his original intention being to use only a single button. Sakurai would later leave HAL due to organizational issues restricting his creativity, as well as the appealing prospect of working with new and interesting creators. While Sakurai may continue to be a high-profile developer, some young talent is often and overlooked. Echo the Dolphin is a staple of the 1990s Sega catalogue, with three titles coming out in the decade and a single release in the year 2000. A few years back, and I apologize for my pronunciation here, Ed Nuziata, the series creator, took to Twitter to provide fans with some insights into his game. 
In his tweets, Ed revealed some fascinating information, such as Echo's name originally being Delphinus, and that the blue ripple effect which appeared in the background of the game's text screens was originally a bug. Ed also tweeted, Obscure Echo Trivia number 5. Zolt Below was 19 years old when he did 95% of the art of Echo 1 and 2. Zolt would continue to work on the Echo series until its final release in 2000, Echo the Dolphin, Defender of the Future. There were plans for a sequel after this, named Echo Sentinels of the Universe, but it was cancelled, possibly surrounding the discontinuation of the Sega Dreamcast in 2001. Lastly, let's jump back and explore the early days of Satoshi Tajiri. Tajiri started his career as a writer and editor for the video game enthusiast fanzine Game Freak. This was before the company moved into the world of video game development. At this time, Game Freak was much smaller, and their publication was little more than handwritten pages which were stapled together. The publication had mild success, with their best-selling issue reaching 10,000 sales. Ken Sugimori, who would eventually become the illustrator of the early Pokémon releases, came across the magazine in a store, which led him to join the team. Tajiri felt that video games were becoming lackluster in quality, and decided to solve this issue by having the company create their own games. In 1989, Tajiri directed his first published game with Game Freak, Mendel Palace. Tajiri was still only 24 years old, and Ken Sugimori was 25. And now for this episode's random piece of trivia. Today, we'll be taking a look at Mega Man Extreme 2, also known as Rockman X2 Solar Razor in Japan, which released in 2001 for the Game Boy Color. Due to a translation error during the game's localization, the Reploid Research Laboratory was incorrectly written as Reploid Research Lavatory during the game's opening cutscene. This error wasn't even fixed for the title's 3DS Virtual Console release over a decade later. And today we'll be talking about credit sequences in video games. Sonic the Hedgehog on the Genesis isn't exactly known for its easter eggs, but it does have one or two that may surprise you. During normal gameplay, a screen appears during the game's boot up, which reads Sonic Team Presents. But hidden behind this screen are some secret Japanese credits. It's normally impossible to see them, as both the text and the background are black. By hacking the game to adjust its palettes, or by using a cheat code, it's possible to invert the background of this screen to make the writing visible. In the Japanese version of the game, pressing C six times, and then up, down, 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 left, right should trigger a confirmation sound. When the game's demonstration starts, holding down A, B, and C, and then pressing start or waiting for the demo to end will remove the Sonic Team Presents graphic and invert the background. Another game with a secret attached to its credits is Secret of Evermore. Evermore had a mixed response from American audiences, possibly due to the fact that many believed Square was only willing to give America either Secret of Evermore or a localized version of Seiken Densetsu 3, but not both. This doesn't seem to be true, however, as the Evermore team was entirely separate from the Seiken Densetsu team, with many of them being new in the industry and having no involvement with localization decisions. The Evermore team seemed to enjoy having fun referencing themselves and their own in-jokes, which can be seen in the game's ending credits. Waiting for approximately 30 minutes after the end appears on screen, an additional message appears stating, you are a patient one, aren't you? Well, here's another cryptic credit just for you. Followed by a lone credit, Dolly Grip, Brian Fadrow. This is a joke attributed to the lead programmer, Brian Fadrow. Surprisingly, there is a third hidden message in the credits beyond both of these that reads, it's Bill's fault. This message appears very briefly before the screen fades to black. According to Fedrow, It's Bill's Fault was an inside joke regarding Bill Christensen, another one of the programmers working on the game, who had a particular habit of being at fault when a build of the game was busted. Front Mission Gun Hazard, the Japanese exclusive first entry in the Front Mission series, has a bizarre inclusion from a sample of a radical right-wing call after its credits. After the end credits, the sample can be heard very quietly under the sound of helicopters. Almost inaudible, the statement is spoken by a member of the UK radical organisation Combat 18. What can be heard is only a small sample of the full call. Gideon Z, who discovered this odd use of sampling, credits the track Dog Tribe by Fundamental, where it is included before the track begins. The portion of the call used, without distortion but censored by ourselves, reads 
BMP's got your card, Mark, you b****s. We're going to burn your building down, you f***heads. C-18's watching you, you communist nigger loving b****y For today's random piece of trivia, let's talk about Nintendo's promotion for Chibi Robo Park Patrol on the Nintendo DS. Initially on release, Chibi Robo was only sold in Walmart stores in the US because of Walmart's strong environmental program and social giving campaign. This environmentalism is part of the game's theme, and Nintendo wanted to go a step further than just limiting its release to a single store as if that would make a difference, and do its part to help the environment. Registering the game on Nintendo's website would enter players into a random prize draw, with the prize being packets of seeds given away to 500 people. Today we'll be talking about games which changed genre during their production. Video games naturally change quite a bit as they're being developed. Mechanics are expanded upon, and the game's world is fleshed out. However, some games end up being so different to their original concept that they're barely recognizable. One of these games is Super 3D Noah's Ark, which was developed and self-published by Wisdom Tree. The title was never submitted to Nintendo for official approval, and is the only unofficial North American SNES game to receive a commercial release. However, this isn't the most interesting fact about the game. Originally, the title didn't feature biblical characters at all, and was in fact based on Clive Barker's 1987 movie Hellraiser. Wisdom Tree acquired the rights to make a game based on the film for $50,000, and licensed the Wolfenstein 3D engine from id Software. Development for the game began on the original NES, a console which the team had experience in with their previous unlicensed game, Bible Adventures. To make the title run smoothly, the game would have needed a cartridge equipped with a co-processor to triple the processing speed of the NES. However, development of this version was halted after Wisdom Tree were unable to work around the NES's strict palette limitations. Another factor was the cartridge itself, which would have been extremely expensive to produce, had an estimated retail cost of $100 per unit. Wisdom Tree then allowed their Hellraiser license to expire, and instead retooled the game for the SNES as Super 3D Noah's Ark keeping the Wolfenstein 3D engine and first-person perspective. Another game that completely changed styles during production is id Software's Quake. Early reports about the game say it was much more fantasy-based, and featured a character similar to Thor, who also swung and threw a giant hammer. An even bigger change was that the game was also said to be a much slower-paced action RPG. The game was also said to feature third-person melee combat inspired by Virtua Fighter. The game was ultimately retooled to use the fast first-person shooter mechanics that it were known for. Quake isn't the only game that got a speed increase during production. Sega's Dreamcast classic, Sonic Adventure, was also planned to be a Sonic role-playing game. Takashi Izuka, the senior game designer on Sonic 3 and Sonic and & Knuckles, pushed for Sonic's first mainline 3D title to be a Sonic RPG. Although the idea to include RPG mechanics was abandoned, the team decided to keep the more story-focused approach of an RPG. This ultimately led to Sonic Adventure having a much greater emphasis on plot than previous Sonic games. And now for this episode's random piece of trivia. This time we're taking a look at the Dead or Alive franchise. Dead or Alive 2 initially released in arcades, and was brought to the Dreamcast shortly after. Team Ninja were asked to port the game to the PlayStation 2 in just a few months, as a fast turnaround in time for the PS2's launch window would guarantee high sales. But before the team's two and a half month deadline was up, the company's sales general manager asked to borrow a copy of the game. The manager took the game straight to production without the team's consent, which led to the unfinished game being published in Japan. This sent the game's creator, Tomonobu Itagaki, into a deep depression and almost led to him quitting the games industry. Soon after, Itagaki and his team went back to overhaul the game to create an improved version of the title, which released worldwide as Dead or Alive 2 Hardcore. Today we'll be talking about pirates and video games. There are many games that focus on or feature pirates. One of the best known series to showcase these buccaneers is the Monkey Island franchise. Monkey Island can be credited as one of the driving forces behind the sales of the point and click genre. And this success in the gaming market wasn't ignored by the rest of LucasArts, as they considered the idea of creating a feature film. 
This occurred while Curse of Monkey Island was in the midst of development, and so it was believed by many that Curse of Monkey Island was the movie itself. However, according to Sam and Max creator Steve Purcell, the animated movie would have featured an original story and introduced new characters. And we can't discuss the idea of a Monkey Island film without talking about Disney's Pirates of the Caribbean. Ted Elliott, the writer for Pirates, was rumoured to have worked on the Monkey Island film proposal, but this is factually incorrect. Many believed Pirates of the Caribbean was inspired by the games, but the film's writers emphatically deny the allegations that they plagiarised any element of the Monkey Island series. Addressing the rumour, Terry Rosio, who is another writer for Pirates of the Caribbean, stated, you should really know your facts before making not so subtle accusations of plagiarism. Ted Elliott was never hired to write a story or screenplay to the computer game Monkey Island. Not in the year 2000 or any other year. Ironically, the creator of Monkey Island have acknowledged their inspiration and debt to the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. Speaking of Pirates of the Caribbean, the Game Boy Advance release for Curse of the Black Pearl had a rather odd password. The password was L1TTLVN, which spells out the word Littlen, a contraction of the words Little One. When entered, the game will display a photograph of a newborn baby with the words Congratulations Tom and Yvonne. The only Tom credited on the game is the game and level designer Tom Heaton who would later go on to work as a design director for Supermassive Games, creators of Until Dawn. Since the Curse of the Black Pearl game was released in 2003, this baby would now be at least 14 years old. Sticking to the theme of pirates, let's take a look at 1987 Sid Meier's Pirates. As a way to deter software piracy, ironic, the player is prompted to answer questions when starting the game based on material in the game's manual. Failing to answer these properly will cause a spike in difficulty, with some parts of the game being impossible to overcome. This includes a forced failure during the game's tutorial sword fight. The game will also start the player with lower health and a smaller crew. It will also immediately force all four countries, England, Spain, France and the Netherlands, to target the player. And for today's random piece of trivia, we're talking about Mickey Mania, specifically an oddity in how it performed its duties in region locking. The Japanese version of the game is locked to only play on Japanese systems, and inserting the game into a non-Japanese Mega Drive will display a typical message which reads, developed for the use of NTSC Mega Drive systems. However, if the system is modified to allow for a switch to change the console's region, or the game is played on an emulator that can change the system's region during gameplay, the message can be altered. Switching the region during gameplay will cause the message to change to, oh, this machine has somehow become an NTSC Mega Drive system. The game will then proceed to boot up as normal. Usually, a game wouldn't recognize a region change mid-game, and it would only detect it as it's booting up. This behavior means that the game was constantly checking the region of the console while the screen is displayed. Today we'll be covering developers that included their children in games. The team at Game Freak enjoy putting easter eggs and references in their games, sometimes where it's least expected. Junichi Masuda was given the job of both producer and director for Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire, and seems to have used this extra authority to include an easter egg of his own. Kiri, who can be found in Sutopolis City, provides the player with two berries each day they visit her. This girl's name, Kiri, is based on the name of Masuda's daughter. She was born in September 2002, just two months before the release of Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire in Japan. Masuda stated on his blog, I wrote most of the message that appears when she gives you berries, because Kiri is a special character for me. Near the end of the game's development, I was asked to include her without letting many people know about it. I came up with that message, with my hope for her. At that time, Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire was almost complete, and we were mostly debugging the game. But there still were decisions to be made. This isn't the only Nintendo product to feature a developer's child, as can be seen with Earthbound. The game's English localization was largely performed by Marcus Lindblom, who held a large volume of authority when it came to decision making. During a livestream with Earthbound Central, Lindblom revealed that he named the character of Nico, found in Magicant, after his real life daughter who was born during his work on Earthbound. Prior to this, Nico's name was a curiosity amongst English Earthbound fans, as the character didn't have the same name in Japan. 
Whilst this next piece of trivia is still speculation, we feel it explains a lot about the localization of the tactical RPG Chaos Wars. Released on the PlayStation 2 in 2006, the game features a cast of characters crossing over from Idea Factory's other releases, including popular series like Shadow Hearts and Grow Lancer. The title became a cult classic, not because of its gameplay, but purely because of the poor quality of the English voice acting in its localization. So, can you move, Uru? Karen? Wow, I really can't move my body. It's believed by many that all of the game's voice actors were family members of Chris Jelenic, the CEO of the game's North American publisher, O3 Entertainment. In the game's credits, several voice actors' surnames are also Jelenic, such as Quest and Tyler, with special thanks to Kay and Lee Jelenic. The act of including family members over qualified voice actors may seem innocent to many, as it helps to introduce your family to potential careers through your own success. However, nepotism is considered to be incredibly immoral and unfair in practice. This is because it restricts potential qualified individuals from having a chance at a paid gig, simply because they weren't born into a family already working in their desired field. Adding to this, the game's notoriously poor voice acting has caused some fans to harbor resentment over this decision. You swine! What do you think you're doing? And now it's time for this episode's random piece of trivia. Today we're looking at the action RPG Diablo. After installing the Hellfire expansion for the original Diablo, if the player creates a text document in the Hellfire install directory with the name command.txt, the dialogue spoken by Narkrul, the demon imprisoned in the void by Diablo himself, will change. Narkrul originally stated, Out of my way, wretched human! Retribution calls for he whom you call Diablo! But with the modification, he will say, I am free! Free to confront the one who banished me to the boy, Diablo! Hi everybody, and I'm free to reward you, little mortal, with these Aerosmith tickets. You'll be getting backstage passes. You'll get to meet Steven Tyler and the whole band this Friday at the Coliseum. Thanks for getting me out of there. By the way, I'm gonna have to kill you. I'll be right back with the trafficking weather together. Today, we're looking at projects that have the popular animator Don Bluth's name attached. Dragon's Lair is one arcade game which saw cult fame. With its hand-drawn animations and extreme difficulty spikes, many consider it to be a demonstration of how traditional art and video games can work hand in hand. Don Bluth, popular animator and film director of movies such as An American Tale, was one of the game's creators and artists. And while creating one of the characters, Bluth drew from some unexpected source material. According to Bluth, Princess Daphne's design was heavily inspired by Gary Goldman's Playboy magazine collection. Bluth and Goldman had worked together on several films prior to the creation of Dragon's Lair. Bluth used the magazines for reference, as well as partial inspiration from Marilyn Monroe. Bluth said, I, who had never looked at a Playboy magazine before, was introduced to one by Gary Goldman, who pointed out there were several provocative pictures within, and that they may inspire us. There was a lot of the Marilyn Monroe image that came across with Daphne. She was a cliché of the dumb blonde. Dragon's Lair received a large number of ports, with varying results. When it came to the game's Amiga port, programmer Randy Linden, who worked on the game's copy protection to deter piracy, left a note to those wishing to crack the game. The note states, A message to crackers. Nobody wants copy protection. All it is designed to do is give a program a fighting chance. Now we realize that there is a great competition to see which group breaks this game first. However, if you do break it, please consider this. If you let this game out early after release, and there are few sales, it will be very difficult to justify follow-up games of this type. Nobody benefits, not the developers, not the user, and not the Amiga community. Please reconsider holding on for a while and not letting the game suffer. The decision is yours. Due to the fact that Dragon's Lair wasn't shared online until several months later, either the notoriously difficult copy protection helped to deter illegal copying of the game, or this message pulled at the heartstrings of those who would have bypassed this protection. Randy Linden would later go on to work on the commercialized Sony PlayStation emulator Bleem before the project ultimately caved into legal pressure. Linden was then hired by Sony and was put to work on the PlayStation 1 emulation on the PlayStation 2, and later the PSP and PlayStation 3. 
Bluth didn't just work on his own project in the game industry. In 2004, Bluth was contacted by Namco to work on one of their biggest franchises. At the time, the Japanese company was working on a new Pac-Man game with the development name Pac-Man Adventures. Namco contacted Bluth, hoping that he would provide concept art. Don agreed and was taken on as a design consultant. Bluth designed several characters and environments for the project alongside Blitz Games, including a number of backstory elements. Whilst the game never saw a release as it was ultimately cancelled, a number of the elements from this project were repurposed for the release of Pac-Man World 3. And now for this episode's random piece of trivia. Today we've chosen to talk about Sega's arcade racer Daytona USA 2. The game isn't exactly known for its easter eggs, but it does contain a noteworthy secret. If the player stops at the finish line of the beginner's course for about 30 seconds while rapidly pressing the start button, a message reading Go to Hell will appear on the finish Line's bulletin board. And today we'll be looking at games which were censored in Japan. Censorship isn't uncommon in the gaming industry, especially when games are brought to new regions. In some instances, however, developers will have to censor a game for even their own region, as can be seen with Super Smash Bros. for the Wii U. The Japanese are usually quite liberal when it comes to sexualized content in games. That said, one trophy in Super Smash Bros. for Wii U was specifically altered in Japan. The Japanese trophy for Wonderful 101's Wonder Pink is different to the international version. As well as having a different pose, all details underneath her skirt have been obscured with a shadow. As can be seen in the character's textures, Wonder Pink's underwear has been completely masked, making any upskirt peaks futile. It's believed this was done to comply with Japan's zero rating system and guarantee the game an A rating, which is comparable to the ESRB's E for Everyone. Some Western games are also censored when brought to Japan. For example, Deus Ex Human Revolution was censored when brought to the region. Because of his ability to punch through walls, the game's protagonist, Adam Jensen, is able to find a secret room. This room is filled with nuke virus software, a valve that will turn off some poisonous gas, and two adult toys on a mattress next to a bottle of lubricant. These toys caused the game to be delayed in Japan, pushing its release back by about a month. The Japanese Zero Ratings Board prohibits the depiction of sex objects in retail games, and according to Matt of Super Best Friends Play, who worked as a QA tester for Square Enix's Eidos Montreal studio at the time, the team had to perform dildo duty. The duty had QA testers manually search through the entire game in order to find any potential remnants of adult toys in levels. In the game's director's cut release, the dildos are absent regardless of the region. Another game which was censored in Japan was the cult classic Oddworld Abe's Odyssey. In the original Western release of Oddworld Abe's Odyssey, the logo for the Madokan Pop depicts a Madokan head on a stick, dripping with blood. The Japanese design was changed to a more generic looking popsicle. Although this may seem like a simple case of censoring gore, there's actually a more specific reason that the Madokan Pop was altered. According to Abe's Odyssey director, the luscious Lorne Lanning, the redesign was due to a gruesome incident in Japan. Lanning told Eurogamer, in content, you always have to be careful with changing market conditions or events. For instance, for Madokan Pops, the logo was originally a head on a stick. And then something happened in Japan where a kid murdered someone in a schoolyard, school kids, and then hung the head on a stick on the front of the school, and it shocked the Japanese people. This murder was one event in the Kobe Child murders, as they came to be known, which occurred during the game's development. The updated Madokan Pop logo was adopted internationally, and was used for all versions of Oddworld games going forward. And now for today's random piece of trivia. Today we're looking at the classic Sega Genesis platformer Kid Chameleon. The game's titular protagonist, Kid Chameleon, was actually based on a real-life employee from Sega at the time, Dean Sitton. Sitton was involved in the early stages of development for the first Sonic the Hedgehog game, as well as being responsible for naming a number of badniks and Dr. Ivo Robotnik himself. Sitton also chose the titles of the Genesis games Quackshot and Decap Attack. In today's video, we'll be talking about people who have become addicted to gaming and the internet. 
Internet cafes aren't quite as prevalent in the West compared to the East, so stories surrounding these recreational cafes are sometimes hard to appreciate. However, they are home to a number of bizarre stories, most of which come from China. A 24-year-old Chinese woman under the pseudonym Xiao Yun had been missing for 10 years and was presumed dead by both the police and her parents. With the popularity of internet cafes in the country, police will perform spot checks at the cafes to confirm no suspicious activity is being conducted. After a check in the Kangchao district of Hangzhou in 2015, police came across a woman using a fake ID. After taking her in for further investigation, it was discovered that she matched the description of a missing person from the nearby Dongyang city. Zhao Yun confessed the details of her identity, claiming that she had been a rebellious teenager who ran away from home following arguments with her father. Talking to Tianjiang Evening News, she stated, I had run away from home before, and at that time, when I tried to ask my dad for some money, my parents wouldn't give it to me, saying I must be lying so I decided to run away for good. She had spent the 10 years sleeping in internet cafes and bathhouses, often relying on donations from other cafe users, whilst also working as a cashier in the cafes to earn additional income. She spent much of her time playing the online first-person shooter Crossfire, a game developed in Korea with a strong following in the region. Customers of cafes would often ask her to play for them on their behalf, helping to support her even further. This is not the only recorded case of a person spending years of their life in an internet cafe. The Beijing Times reported on China's growing issues with internet addiction in 2013, covering the story of Li Meng, a young man who spent much of his time in an internet cafe located in Changchun. He only ever left the premises for food or to take a shower. Often, Li Meng would refuse to communicate with other customers, with the cafe owner claiming that he'd been there for so long that most people barely noticed his presence anymore, describing him as straightforward and of little annoyance. After a reporter for the Beijing Times was able to speak to the young man, he revealed that his monthly income was the equivalent to $322, 80 of which went to the cafe each month. Camps designed to help cure those with internet addiction have been created, though there are many reports of violence being used to discipline the patients. In August of 2017, it was reported that a Chinese teenager had died within 48 hours of being admitted to one of those camps. The cause of death is unknown, though the 18-year-old was found with over 20 external and internal injuries. The camp involved claimed the use of gentle treatment, including psychological counseling and physical exercise, ensuring that they do not condone the use of capital punishment. Many of the rehab facilities present themselves as making use of military tactics to discipline those with the addiction, with some being known to make use of electroshock therapy, a process which was banned by the Chinese government in 2017. According to the figures provided by a camp given to Wired magazine, they claim that as many as 80% of the youth in China struggle with the obsession, though the figure cannot be verified. And now it's time for this episode's random piece of trivia. Today we're talking about Mario Paint, because I feel like we all need a break after that. During the Mario Paint title screen, the player can mess around with the letters in the Mario Paint logo to see a variety of different gags. Clicking the letter R will play the sound of what can be assumed to be a baby laughing. However, if this sound is reversed and slowed down by around 50%, we can hear a close approximation of the original Nintendo recording. Instead of a baby laughing, we can hear a voice simply saying, Nintendo. Nintendo. Today we'll be focusing on media and events that influenced video games. When it comes down to it, practically everything is inspired or influenced by something else. But these inspirations are often overlooked or not very obvious on the surface. This is definitely the case for Nier's Drakengard series, which unbeknownst to most has never shied away from controversial inspirations. The game's director, Yoko Taro, even mentioned how the original Nier was inspired by the events surrounding the September 11th terrorist attacks, as well as the ensuing war on terror. In an interview with Kotaku, Yoko Taro was asked about his plot inspirations for the series' sequel, Nier Automata. Taro stated that while he didn't directly correlate the plot to events in the real world, on reflection, he feels he may have been influenced by the political climate at the time. Taro said, For example, changes from reason to emotion and objective to subjective, 
which are represented by President Trump being elected and the UK leaving the EU. I believe that themes in video games are something that players should find out themselves, so I have not specified one. Square Enix games don't always have such real-world inspirations, however. Final Fantasy XV's lead game designer, Juan Hasma, revealed some of the inspirations that he felt were used with the title. For example, the cooking and food culture of the game were influenced by Hasma's love of travel and cooking. Another focus of Hasma was making sure the game's fantasy world was a believable one. For this, he looked to Back to the Future Part 2, specifically how Marty reacted to the future compared to the people that lived there. Hasma stated, Near the start of the movie, you see Marty McFly walking through this alley. This is his first time into the future. And then when the scene opens up, you can actually see flying cars. There's hoverboards and all that stuff. But people are walking normally. Because they've seen that culture throughout all the years, they wouldn't be surprised. But you would be surprised. So the idea of the whole creative process is to provide the culture shock. But at the same time, you have to make it realistic. Another company that's drawn inspiration from popular media is Valve, who have made some of the most popular games of all time, such as the Half-Life series. One big influence for Half-Life was, in fact, Stephen King's The Mist. In King's short story, a mist descends on a small town, and brings with it a slew of terrible tentacled beasts. Within the story, the joint suicide of two soldiers alludes to the idea that the events taking place were the result of experiments taking place in the nearby military installation. The working title for Half-Life was in fact Quiver, which was likely a nod to Arrowhead, the name of the military base in the book. And now for this episode's random piece of trivia. Today we're talking about a weird real-life connection between a dictator and the Prince of Persia series. After Colonel Gaddafi was ousted from his home during the 2011 Libyan Civil War, footage surfaced of rebels walking through his palace. Within this footage, it's revealed that adorning one of the walls is a large reproduction art piece of the front cover from Prince of Persia, Warrior Within. While the footage holds no clues as to why the art is there, many believe the painting's presence in the palace comes from Gaddafi's son, Moatassem Billah Gaddafi, being a big fan of the series. And today we'll be looking at point-and-click adventure games. LucasArts is known for their extensive history of the point-and-click genre. Their first published title, Maniac Mansion, released in 1987. The title innovated early point-and-click games with a new kind of interface and multiple playable characters. One term which Maniac Mansion brought to the industry was the use of the word cutscene. Originally coined by one of the game's creators, Ron Gilbert, the term was used within the code as a command to automatically save a state before the game is interrupted by a story scene. Though now a common practice within games, Maniac Mansion was one of the first to do so during actual gameplay and not just at the end of a level. LucasArts saw major competition in the genre, and from one company in particular, Sierra Games. This competition led to some unique marketing, with one instance getting Sierra into trouble over their advertising for King's Quest VI. The trouble was connected to a pamphlet included in the game's retail release, as well as a song in the game titled Girl in the Tower. Sierra sent the song to many radio stations and left a list of these stations in the pamphlet. The pamphlet also suggested that fans should call in and demand that the track be played. Seeing as the game sold 400,000 copies at launch, the result was an overwhelming number of calls for the radio stations. Most refused to play the song flat out, and various stations threatened to sue Sierra when their phone lines were jammed by people requesting the track. LucasArts followed Maniac Mansion with Zack McCracken and the Alien Mindbenders, which had a subtle way of dealing with people pirating the game. When traveling to the various locations, the player must enter a relevant code from a book included in the game box. This was a common form of anti-piracy at the time, checking that the player had a legitimate copy of the title. If the key is entered incorrectly five times, they will be sent to pirate prison instantly and confronted with the prison guard who will berate them, saying, I just can't understand it, a nice boy like you flagrantly breaking the law. I hope you rot in there. 
As for you, I'll assume your finger slipped while entering the exit visa code. But if not, I think it's high time you bought a legitimate copy of this game. The designers worked long and hard to bring Zack McCracken to life, and we want to encourage them to create more exciting adventures, don't we? So hurry on down to your local software store and buy your very own copy. Remember, only you can stop worldwide stupidity. See ya! Without entering legitimate codes, the player will be trapped in the prison with no escape. And for this episode's random piece of trivia, today we're looking at the 2016 reboot of Doom. In the game, the player is able to get an achievement called Shoot It Until It Dies, which is awarded by defeating the Cyber Demon at the end of the Lazarus Labs chapter. This line is a reference to a fake fan-made scan of an old issue of GamePro magazine, which tells the player to defeat the Cyber Demon, shoot at it until it dies. Despite being a joke and a forgery, the image is often thought to be real by gamers that don't know any better. The image was made by Andrew Stein, the co-founder of Doom World, a fan community for the Doom series. Today we'll be talking about video game developer office cultures. To most of us, school is something you just have to get through. You study, you make friends, well hopefully anyway, you're taught life skills to use in some sort of profession, and then it's time to move on. Goodbye regimented school life, or perhaps not. Back in 1996, a video game developer by the name of Giles Goddard became one of the first foreign, or gaijin, workers at Nintendo. During his time at the company, Goddard helped work on projects such as Super Mario 64 and 1080 snowboarding, before leaving to form his own company, Vitae, in 2002. When asked about what it was like working for Nintendo, Goddard told Source Gaming, Nintendo is a bit like a big school. You have a bell at 8.45 and a bell at 12 o'clock and another bell at 1 o'clock and then another bell at 4 or 5. You have bells throughout the day to tell you exactly what you should be doing. It's very Japanese. Furthermore, in a similar interview about the making of Super Mario 64 with Pixelatron, he says there was no talking. Occasionally, you'd get little groups of programmers or artists getting together for a chat, and somebody higher up would walk over and give them the eye, and then they'd sit down and shut up. Coincidentally, Nintendo did set up a school of sorts. During the development of New Super Mario Bros. 2, a course was put together with the intention of teaching employees from other backgrounds in the company how to make Mario games professionally. It was unofficially titled the Mario Cram School and was created by longtime video game producer Takashi Tezuka. The hope was to combat the fact that, allegedly, out of the entire development team, only the director and art director had long-term experience producing 2D Mario games. The idea paid off and actually led to several new features for New Super Mario Bros. 2 such as the nighttime levels, Dash Mario levels and two-player co-op. Nintendo aren't the only company that like to generate and develop new ideas through employee collaboration. Twice a year, the video game developer Riot Games hosts an event with the title The Riot Thunderdome. This is a 48-hour event where employees, or rioters, can get stuck in and create anything they want in any role they choose. The end goal of this event is to create a viable product that could potentially ship within 48 hours. Riot have said, Our goal is rarely to ship something to the public, rather it's to jam on creative ideas, get out of our comfort zones, and maybe learn some lessons along the way. This being said, a group of rioters known as Team PVC did manage to create a game called Zig's Arcade Blast in the 48 hours given, and is now available to play for free. And now it's time for this episode's random piece of trivia. Today we'll be looking at the game 1979 Revolution, Black Friday. Released in 2016, the game covers the 1979 Iranian Revolution. It was created by an Iranian-born game designer who previously worked with Rockstar Games, Navid Konsari. Konsari and his team conducted a number of interviews with Iranians who lived through this period of the country's history to make sure the game's storyline was true to life and based on their real accounts of what happened. On release, the title saw wide praise for its historical accuracy and authenticity. However, one group felt the game was nothing more than propaganda which aimed to make the players feel pro-American and anti-Iranian. Iran's National Foundation for Computer Games blocked all websites that sold the game within 48 hours of its release, ultimately leading to a countrywide ban. 
it seems the developers knew the game could see some backlash from the start. Several members of the development team used aliases to hide their identity from the Iranian government in the game's credits, and the game's concept artist ultimately fled Iran due to his involvement in the project. In today's episode, we'll explore games which received disdain from the people involved in the franchise and or the game's creation. Over the past few decades, the game industry has slowly shifted towards digital distribution over physical discs. Games changing after their initial release has since become common, with updates introducing new mechanics and adding additional features. One title that made use of this feature was 2003's Postal 2, which was known for its controversial subject material. The game had a less well-received sequel, Postal 3, which wasn't developed by the franchise owners, Running With Scissors. Fans of the series were extremely disappointed with the resulting sequel, as were Running With Scissors. In Postal 2's shopping mall location, a video game store could be found which had the signage revealing that it would open in June of 2016. To the surprise of many, these signs turned out to be speaking the truth, as the game was updated to make the location accessible. Inside the store, the player can find a VR headset similar to that of the HTC Vive, which when worn will send the player into a location known as Steam. Inside are a number of parody versions of popular Steam titles, as well as a sports almanac referencing Back to the Future Part 2. Speaking with the cashier will provide players with tips from the future, such as suggesting the player bets on the Red Sox or that you shouldn't buy Postal 3. Whilst Postal's disappointed creators didn't work on the third game, other developers had no one to blame but themselves. One developer over at Atari felt so strongly about the project they worked on that they left a displeased message in the game's data. Enterprise was released on both the Amiga and the Atari ST, and it's generally agreed by many that the title is of poor quality. On the game's second disc, the file warningd.bat can be found. This file contains all of the game's spoken dialogue. One of these pieces of dialogue isn't played in the game and is nothing but gibberish. <laughs> However, by reversing the audio, one of the game's developers can be heard sharing his opinions on the game. Is, is rubbish. Another title of questionable quality is the LJN-produced Back to the Future game on the NES. Bob Gale, the co-producer of Back to the Future, wasn't involved with the game even though he wanted to be. When asked about working with Telltale for their 2010 adventure games, Gale brought up the subject voluntarily, saying, I should note that the previous Back to the Future video games have all sucked eggs, particularly the Nintendo 8-bit cartridge made by LJN in 1989. Truly one of the worst games ever. The LJN people did not want any input from the filmmakers, but they promised to show us the game when it was ready. I was outraged when they finally showed it to me and had all kinds of things I wanted to change, but of course we were told it was too late to change anything. I actually did interviews telling fans not to buy it, because I was so ashamed that a product this bad would have our brand on it. And now it's time for today's random piece of trivia, so let's check out the world of hired hands. In Hitman Blood Money, an odd easter egg can be found in the mission Till Death Do Us Part. Near the water at the front of a mansion, a small coin can be found. When shot, the group of guests who had previously been fighting will lose all of their clothes before running towards Agent 47 clapping their hands. After a short while, this group will stop clapping and begin to fight again, though still wearing nothing but their underwear. Today we'll be looking at trivia surrounding video game logos and box arts. Over the years it's become much easier for publishers to showcase their games. For a while, however, games were predominantly sold through the appeal of their box art. Because of this, publishers considered the box to be one of the most important elements of marketing a game, and put substantial effort into them. Sometimes this effort can go unnoticed, as is the case with 1993's Doom. While the team at id were trying to come up with an image for their game's cover, illustrator Don Punchatz hired a model to pose in the reference photo for his final illustration. Doom creator John Romero was instructing how the model should pose, explaining that Doom Guy would be on a hill firing down on an infinite number of demons attempting to attack him. However, none of the model's positions were working for Romero. John said on his blog post, I threw my shirt off and told him to give me the gun and get on the floor. Grab my arm as one of the demons. 
I aimed the gun in a slightly different direction and told Don, this is what I'm talking about. Don took several pictures. I moved the gun some, the demon grabbed my leg, other arm, etc. I am the doom guy. Although Romero had direct control over how his work was marketed, some elements to box art aren't always in the hands of their creators. Dead Island, released in 2011, is an open world survival horror game. And like many, many, many games at the time, it featured zombies. So it was no surprise that the logo depicted the silhouette of a corpse hanging from a tree as the letter I. However, due to the ESRB restrictions on how a game can be marketed, this was altered in the North American release to have the zombie silhouette standing instead. Despite this change, the logo remained unaltered in-game. Speaking of logos, there is much debate around the origin of the Atari logo, with multiple stories describing how it was designed. The logo was first seen publicly on the Space Race cabinet in 1973, and is perhaps one of the most recognizable logos associated with gaming and its history. In a 1983 interview with Video Games Magazine, the logo's designer, George Opperman, explained the origins of the logo, saying, Symbols are just visual nicknames that combine first letters and interpretive design elements. I kept trying to stylize an A, then I looked at Pong. Pong had a center line and a force, the ball, that kept hitting its center from either side. I thought that the force would bend the center outwards, and that's what I designed. Nolan Bushnell, co-founder of Atari, has other ideas regarding the logo's origins. He thinks that Opperman created various conflicting stories on purpose, such as rumors of it being designed to look like Mount Fuji, or a kanji character meaning hit. However, George Farrico, one of the creative directors for Atari, thinks that all of this is untrue. He claims that he was handed a number of rough sketches to choose from, and simply picked one that he liked. He believes that Opperman's explanations are just stories. And now for this episode's random piece of trivia. Today we're talking about Serious Sam 2, a personal favorite from my childhood. In the game, while in the Forsaken compound, a small easter egg can be found. If the player turns off a path near the end of the level, they will discover a hat and coat of a duke, then subsequently a skeleton. An audio prompt can be heard stating, Secret duke skeleton has been found. Sam will also say, Dude, you've been hanging here like forever. This is of course in reference to the infamous Duke Nukem Forever, which had been stuck in development hell for several years and at the time remained unreleased. Today, as a Halloween treat, we'll be telling you some horrific stories involving video games. Let's be honest, we all love a good story about a controversy, weird event, or how a project went wrong. These horror stories come from all industries, and of course gaming is no exception. One unfortunate event occurred in Brazil in 2009, where one man used gaming material to provoke and terrify the public. The man was looking to collect a debt totaling around 42 Brazilian real, the equivalent of around 13 US dollars. The man broke into the house of a 60-year-old woman and held her hostage, although luckily no one was harmed. Images of the assailant showed his weapon of choice, a surprisingly slim-looking pistol. This pistol was in fact a Sega Light Phaser, the light gun used with the Sega Master System. The Master System had a strong presence in Brazil, being one of Sega's strongest regions for console sales. After brandishing real knives and negotiations with the police which lasted over 10 hours, the man let his hostage go and the situation was de-escalated. Just trying to get hold of gaming hardware can be enough to push people to their limits, resulting in fatal consequences. In North America, the radio station KDND ran a contest in January of 2007 called Hold Your Wii for a Wii. During this time, the Nintendo console was in huge demand but with little supply, having sold out in most retail stores. The contest had 17 individuals drinking as much water as they could without urinating, with the winner being the entrant who could hold the most water. Just hours after taking part in the contest, 28-year-old Jennifer Strange passed away from water intoxication. The condition causes the liquid from the blood to move into cells, which then proceed to swell and break down. Brain swelling can also occur, causing devastating brain injuries. The contest began at 6.45am, with each participant being given an 8-ounce water bottle to drink every 15 minutes, though as the contest progressed, the bottle capacities increased to 16 ounces without the prior consent of the contestants. The presenters also added a rule that the bottle must be finished within two minutes. Jennifer was, of course, not the only one to suffer from discomfort. 
During the contest, a call-in at the station tried to inform the DJs of how dangerous this contest would be and that conducting it could be fatal. I want to say that, um, that those people that are drinking all that water can get sick and possibly die from water intoxication. With the response from the presenters being that they were aware of the dangers and that their waivers signed by the contestants protected them from a lawsuit as though that was the only thing that mattered. Yeah, we're aware of that. We're, that's yeah, they, give sign, they sign releases, so we're not responsible. It's okay. And, and if they get to the point where they have to throw up, then they're going to throw up and they're out of the contest before they die. So that's good, right? At no point did the presenters inform the contestants that there was the potential for illness or even death. The DJs even commented on Jennifer's warped stomach, saying that she looked like she was three months pregnant. Jennifer was found passed away at her home after the contest ended, having complained about excessive pain from an extreme headache. Many of those involved in the show were fired, with the hosts feeling it was an unjust termination. They believed that because the contest was cleared by their legal department, that the blame shouldn't lie with them, but those who approved it. After a lengthy legal process, Jennifer's family were awarded $16.6 .6 million in monetary damages, with all fault lying on the parent company of the station. The station has since stopped operations. Another unsettling controversy relates to the 1996 point-and-click adventure game Harvester. Writer and director Gilbert P. Austin held a negative opinion towards any sort of censorship, and his views ultimately led him to create a game which challenged the theory that being involved with or consuming violent media creates violent and abusive people. As expected, the game sparked controversy upon release due to its violent content, which was made worse by its use of interactive movies which made the content more realistic. Despite the controversy, all seemed well, and there wasn't any real evidence to say that Austin's violent game had led to any real crime. Fast forward to 2010, where Kurt Kistler, who plays the role of the game's protagonist, is arrested for possessing child pornography, an obvious act of child abuse. Bizarrely, when taken in for processing, Kistler was wearing a flannel shirt strikingly similar to the one he wore for the game 14 years earlier. The first person known to have died immediately after playing a video game was 18-year-old Peter Bukowski. In October 1982, he suffered a fatal heart attack immediately after making the high score table on the arcade game Berserk at Friar Tuck's Game Room in Illinois, USA. His death was the result of a rare heart condition. And tragically, that's not the only death associated with the Berserk machine at Friar Tuck's. In 1988, Edward Clark Jr. was murdered by Pedro Roberts over an argument about the ownership of a quarter dollar coin that was used to play the machine. Clark was just 17 years old at the time of his death. Today we're exploring games with bizarre and unfortunate naming choices. Games are released across the world and in multiple languages, so finding a name that works across all regions can be troublesome. However, even just releasing it in one country can make for noteworthy titles elsewhere, as can be seen with the Korean exclusive DS title, Touch Dictionary. The game is designed to help Koreans translate words to and from Korean, Japanese, and English. Created by YBM CISA, a company which aims to create software that teaches players the English language, the team behind the game had initially decided on a different title. YBM CISA seemed to try and abbreviate the game's title to make it appear more stylish, with the original name being Touch Dick. The game's developers were unaware of the name's phonetic similarity to Western slang for penis garnering attention online from the humorous name. And it appears the name was changed based on this reaction. Sony would later release a similar piece of software for the PSP, named Hand Dictionary, surprisingly opting to abbreviate the name. Some other developers may need to make similar considerations on shortening their game's names, with one Japanese exclusive game's title leaving little to the imagination. Released in Japan as the title shown on screen, the game has the player act out the daily life of a photojournalism student who is assigned quests by people across the island of Yumagashima. Most of these missions involve taking photos of various schoolgirls' underwear, without getting caught for fear of repercussions. The game's name is likely one of the longest released to date, being translated as Summertime High School, A Young Man's Notes How a new exchange student like myself ran into his childhood friend on the school tour, then for some reason became super popular with the girls of his daily scoops on the school photography club, even though he only takes panty shots, and what he thinks as he goes on dates during his summer of island school life. It's possible the name is a joke by the game's publisher, D3, poking fun at the trend of long run-on titles for other Japanese media. A game title that caused some minor concerns for one person is DayZ, the open-world survival game. 
Of course, the game contained zombies, hence the name. And although the name was apt, lawyers of one person in particular, popular artist Jay-Z, weren't all too happy about this naming choice, as it could kind of maybe sort of sound a little bit like his name. Whilst the team at Bohemia were amused by the situation, with creator Dean Hall admitting that it made him laugh, they of course decided to ignore the lawyer's request and continue using the name. Additionally, an item appears in the game named the Magna Carta, based on the album of the same name by Jay-Z. And now for this episode's random piece of trivia. Today we're checking out Double Dragon Neon, the Double Dragon reboot from WayForward Technologies, which puts players in control of brothers Billy and Jimmy. A boss fight in the game's seventh mission has the player battle mistranslated mutants Bimmy and Jammy. This is a reference to the earlier released Double Dragon 3 from 1990, which included a typo during the game's opening sequence, listing the characters as Bimmy and Jimmy. The game's poor spelling was also ironic, considering the game's subtitle was The Rosetta Stone, a reference to the ancient tablet that helped historians accurately translate the unknown language of ancient Egyptian into the known language of ancient Greek. Today we're going to be looking at hidden easter eggs and references in Nintendo games. Gaming companies tend to have different approaches when it comes to easter eggs in their games. Some absolutely litter their games with secrets, such as Bethesda and Rockstar, while others barely include any. Although they certainly have references to their own legacy and other games, Nintendo seem to be one of the companies with few easter eggs to show. That said, easter eggs do occasionally appear in Nintendo games, as can be seen with one of their newest titles. Within Super Mario Odyssey, the player can find Hint Toad in levels after a boss has been defeated. The character offers to give Mario information on undiscovered moons for a price of 50 coins, and originally appeared in Super Mario Galaxy. But what's interesting about Hint Toad is the actual map that they're holding, as it's not a map for a level found in Mario Odyssey. The map Hint Toad consults throughout the game is actually a map of Super Mario 64's bob -omb Battlefield. This map can even be seen in a brochure inside the Odyssey itself. What's also potentially exciting about this easter egg is that it may be a hint at future DLC for the game, though of course we cannot guarantee that. Moving on to another Nintendo franchise, let's take a look at The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask 3D. The title has several bonus games within it, one of which can be played at the Town Shooting Gallery in East Clocktown. Inside the gallery, there are several items on the counter next to the gallery's owner. One of these items is actually a puzzle toy made by Nintendo in 1980, called the 10 Billion Barrel. The object of the puzzle was to rotate the barrel cylinders and slide the balls between them, in the hope of organizing all of the balls into lines of a single color. The Zelda series gets a lot of love, but a Nintendo series with perhaps an even more dedicated fan base is the Metroid franchise. The fourth game in the series, Metroid Fusion, has a few easter eggs. This includes a hidden GameCube early on in the game that can be found among some rubble. However, a more elusive secret can be found later on in the title. One area of Sector 4 is particularly difficult to reach, and can only be accessed by using the Shine Spark. Once there, dialogue between a Federation official and Adam will unfold, praising the player for finding the location. The conversation concludes with the Federation official saying, I wonder how many players will see this message. One of Nintendo's best-known series is one which crosses over their entire backlog of games, the Super Smash Bros. franchise. This next secret actually appears throughout multiple Smash titles, starting with Melee and most recently appearing in Smash for Wii U. In each game, the texture for Ness's yo-yo has some tiny text on it that states the year of the game's release. In Super Smash Bros. Melee, the text says 2001. For Super Smash Bros. Brawl, it says 2008. And for Super Smash Bros. for Nintendo 3DS and Wii U, it says 2014. And now for this episode's random piece of trivia. Today we're talking about Champions World Class Soccer, particularly the game's European version. Although the game appears to be a fairly unremarkable 90s sports title, it does contain a pretty hilarious translation error. If the game's language option is set to German, the translation for penalty, as in penalty shootout, is misspelled. The screen was meant to display the word Schiesen, with an IE in the middle, meaning to shoot. However, the game displays the word Schiesen with an EI, meaning to shit. Today, we're taking a look at games that were never released. There are tens of thousands of video games in the world today, and for every game on the shelf, there was a game that was canned or perhaps even never announced. 
Many of these failed games are lost to the annals of time, but occasionally some of them will resurface and have a chance to be documented. One example of a cancelled game that wasn't public knowledge until decades later is Sonic's Edusoft. The title was developed by Teartex in 1991, who began making the game after seeing Sonic's success in the gaming space. Details on Sonic's Edusoft development are scarce, but Sega were aware of the game's existence and allowed Teartex to develop it further. However, somewhere down the line, the title's production was halted and it never made it to the approval stage. As the name implies, Sonic's Edusoft is an educational game for the Sega Master System and includes games relating to mathematics and literacy. The game also has three minigames, none of which hold any educational value. One interesting point is that because the Sega game developed so shortly after the release of Sonic 1, likely just before Sega had started developing Sonic 2 in November of 1991, Edusoft is probably the second Sonic game that was ever in development. There's a surprising amount of cancelled games attached to high-profile or cult franchises. The next scrapped game we're talking about belongs to the much-loved Spyro series and is yet another educational game. Spyro Ever After was a game briefly in development by Knowledge Adventure in the early 2000s and would have featured Spyro in a fairy tale setting interacting with characters from popular fables. It's not currently known why Spyro Ever After was scrapped, However, some fans of the series believe that Spyro's license holders didn't want the franchise marketed as something just for young children, and wanted to continue marketing Spyro to a slightly older audience. This would make sense considering the direction the series took with the Legend of Spyro trilogy. Another character that was popularized during the PlayStation's lifespan is Crash Bandicoot. The Crash franchise has a surprising amount of cancelled games, but one of the more interesting scrapped Crash projects is the game Crash Landed. Crash Landed appears to have been a reboot of the series, and was developed by Radical Entertainment for the Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and Nintendo Wii, with Renegade Kid possibly handling the Nintendo DS version. The game's plot centered around Crash trying to save primitive bandicoots, named Bandicoots in the concept art from Neo Cortex, and Dingo Dial would have served as a secondary antagonist for the game. The title was cancelled after two years of development, following Activision acquiring the rights to all of Sierra and its assets. Activision decided to lay off the entire Radical Entertainment studio behind Crash Landed, and didn't seem interested in continuing development with another studio either. And now for today's random piece of trivia. Today we're talking about the Midway Arcade Rail Shooter, Khan Evil. Although the title was well known for its graphic content and, for the time, lifelike gore, one of the game's secrets is even more morbid. Inside Khan Evil's files is an image of serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer. In the image, Dahmer is holding a paper bag containing the head of then-CEO of Midway Games, Neil Nicastro. The unused image appears several times in various sizes within the game, and was most likely used to fill empty spaces in the game's data. Patent. 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 Today we'll be looking at the games industry and the use of patents. In many ways, patents can be seen as a double-edged sword. Whilst their existence is to help prevent others from stealing designs and technology from creators, they can also restrict creativity and progress within various industries. Nintendo, for example, filed a patent in November of 2001, which incorporates both a phone handset and game controller into a single unit. This means that whilst the concept phone can be used like any normal handset, particularly in a time before touchscreens, it also allowed users easier control of gameplay with physical gameplay buttons, just like the N-Gage, you know how good that was. It took almost five years for this US patent to be granted to the console giant. Several diagrams were submitted alongside their claim and patent description demonstrating their concept. Whilst the idea is fairly obvious in design, mobile gaming was still in its infancy when the patent was filed, and certainly not the multi-billion dollar industry it is today. The iPhone, often considered to be the catalyst for the mobile gaming market wouldn't be announced for a whole six years after the Nintendo phone patent was filed. 
Nintendo isn't shy about taking their ideas and protecting them through patents. With Eternal Darkness, the company has a patent which grants the specific description of a sanity system in a video game. The patent covers not only a character's sanity level and how it might be affected by gruesome encounters, but also how a character's preparations before an encounter can affect how much the encounter impacts them. It also describes how as the character's sanity level decreases, gameplay is affected. This includes controlling game effects, audio effects, and visual hallucinations which can all be unique with each playthrough. With this in mind, some games still utilize such a system in a variety of ways, including popular titles such as Indigo Prophecy, released as Fahrenheit outside the US, and Amnesia The Dark Descent. However, patents can prevent developers from incorporating certain design ideas, and some companies will defend their rights over these concepts. Sega, for example, filed a patent prior to the release of the first entry in the Crazy Taxi series. The patent covers a game display method, moving direction indicating method, game apparatus, and drive simulating apparatus. More specifically, the filing claims ownership of a driving game which permits characters to be present in a city and can prevent cruel images of collisions with characters. Characters in a dangerous area are intentionally moved away. The patent also makes claim over an arrow display on screen which guides the player to their destination. This caused issues with EA, who did not take Sega's patents into account with their release of Simpsons Road Rage, which copied many elements from the Crazy Taxi games, including its 3D arrow display. Sega took EA to court over the issue, but both companies decided to settle outside of court for an undisclosed amount. And now it's time for this episode's random piece of trivia, and today we'll be dipping our toes into the Thief universe for an unusual easter egg. In the 2014 release of Thief, developed by Eidos, there is an interesting music nod. In the game, the team make reference to an earlier title created by the parent company, Square Enix. During Chapter 2, the Thief Taker General can be heard whistling a tune at the end of a cutscene. No point in wasting a bolt. and he'll whistle it again as the player approaches his office later in the chapter. The tune may be familiar, as it's actually Frog's theme from the popular RPG Chrono Trigger. Yeah. 